no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continue to be in this meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Due to the volume of, with, of witnesses' requests that we have received, we ask that your testimony remain brief, around three minutes, to ensure that all members of the public who wish to testify are able to testify. Additionally, prior to Councilman Jones recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record that at this time, the chat feature will be used in Microsoft Team to allow members that they wish to signify to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, and at this time, we will uh, take roll to make sure we have a quorum. And when you are, when your name is called, would you please say a few words so that your image can be captured on Channel 64? Uh, Council Member Johnson. Hi, Council Member Johnson. I think you are muted, but we can see you. Councilman Johnson present. Thank you. Council Member Thomas. Council Member Green. Present for the hearing. Council Member Gautier. Hello, Samantha, Mr. Chair, and all the witnesses. I'm happy to be here for this very important discussion. Council Member Gim. Good afternoon, uh, Council Chair, uh, to my colleagues and to all the testifiers and to the public. Thank you for joining us today. Council Member Brooks. Can we uh, make sure that all of our Please put our speakers on mute. Thank you. Council Member Brooks. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. And Chairman Jones. Thank you. And I am present. Uh, Ms. Williams, a quorum is present for this committee. Uh, and we are now coming to order. Um, will you please read the title of the resolution? Resolution number 200397, a resolution authorizing the City Council Committee on Public Safety to hold hearings to review the city's response to protests in support of ending systematic racism in policing and of the Black Lives Matter movement, and to provide residents with a forum to share their experiences and make recommendations for safer and non-discriminatory policing. Thank you. Before we proceed, I would like to hear some opening remarks from the author of this resolution, Council Member Gim. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much to my colleagues on the Public Safety Committee, all of whom supported this resolution, and to the broader viewing public. In late May and early June, tens of thousands of people gathered across our city to speak truth to power, to declare that Black Lives Matter, to say the names of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, to demand accountability and racial justice. They demanded more of their police force, of their governments, and of this nation. And they demanded more of us. As thousands marched through our city to demand a better tomorrow, they were met with a show of force that had not been deployed on such a scale in our city in decades. Militarized vehicles rolled down 52nd Street. Tear gas, pepper spray, and acrid chemicals filled the air. Filled the air. Without warning, rubber bullets and other objects tore through West Philadelphia and on I-676. We're getting, Modesto, we're getting an echo. Thank you. And on I-676, forcing families to evacuate and leaving others with little to no place to retreat. The targeting was indiscriminate. Young people, journalists, seniors, longtime residents living in their homes, observers, demonstrators, even those calling for assistance were met with force. Many of us have witnessed videos and social media posts documenting the chaos, but few of us who were not on the ground have heard directly from the people who experienced it. 
We are here today to center the voices of our residents and to acknowledge and better understand the deep harm caused against Black Philadelphians in particular, residents of color in general, and everyday people exercising their First Amendment rights. We are here because of the perceived and at times in your face disparate treatment by our city, depending on who was doing the protesting. We are called to this responsibility today precisely because the events of May and June tie into a long history of eroding trust and faith in our policing institutions and of government leadership to preserve public safety, to distinguish between First Amendment freedoms and public intimidation or threats. And we know we have a long path ahead of us. A brief comment on the process that you are about to hear tonight. This is not an investigation. There are numerous investigations into what happened, what is going on. What City Council chose instead was a public process of listening, of truth telling, of accountability, driven by the voices and experiences of the people we serve. We believe that if we are to have hope for reconciliation and for true and meaningful change, it has to start with the testimonies you will hear over the next several hours. So you will not hear us ask many questions or query witnesses, except maybe to clarify some answers and some basic facts. Some of what you may hear today may reinforce your beliefs. Others will challenge them. They are not meant to comfort. It is not meant to be easy to hear. Some of you will say that this is not a full picture, and you are correct. This is only a snapshot told through the voices of our residents in their own words and without a filter. I hope people will consider how hard it is for people to have come forward to tell these stories and what it means for people to take a leap of faith to do so. We have to recognize what is at stake when residents who have been subjected to brute force come to their elected officials to demand better. We have to understand how powerful these moments are, that they are not isolated in time, but they are a narrative of people's lived experiences with systemic racism, with policing of communities, and with a sense of an urgent need for safety and confidence that things will change. The anger when we, we heard when we met with individuals and in the collection of this testimony is palpable. And it goes without saying, it is also justified. But we also heard an urgent call for change and transformation and a strong belief that there is no better time for it than now. And in the weeks ahead, we will be challenged not only as a city, but as a nation to uphold our core values and freedoms. We'll be tested about whether our institutions, police and government can respond appropriately as people head to the polls and take to the streets. It is our solemn responsibility to do everything in our power to uphold the trust that Philadelphians place in us. By listening today, we challenge our city, our mayor and our city council to ready ourselves for a more just future. I want to thank the leadership of the committee chair, Chairman Jones, and of all my colleagues on this committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Member Gim, and I understand um, Member Gaudier would like to say a few words. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to first and foremost thank all of the folks submitting uh, testimony today, whether you've opted to speak or to deliver a written account. And I want to thank Chair Jones and my colleague, Councilmember Gim, for creating this forum for people to share their stories. It's not easy to stand up and speak your truth to power. It's not easy to rehash painful experiences like the ones that protesters on I-676 and on West 52nd Street faced earlier this year. And I wanna be perfectly clear, this isn't just pain, this is trauma we're talking about. The very people charged with serving us and protecting us from harm participated in perpetuating the cycle of violence and oppression that these protests targeted in the first place. As a representative of the third district, which includes 52nd Street, I want to take a moment to focus specifically on the events of May 31st. Um, I was on 52nd Street that day. Months later, I remained just as disturbed as ever that police squads came into our community, um, our black residential neighborhood with tanks and firing tear gas and rubber bullets at our own people. Let's not mince words. Um, this was an attack. It was an attack on a residential black community that has been discriminated against by police for generations. It was an attack on families, on young children and seniors alike who choked on tear gas inside their own homes. 
it was an attack on each and every person that was indiscriminately hit with pepper spray or rubber bullets while they were walking towards home or driving in their cars. And it was an attack on whatever trust our community had managed to build with police in the decades since the move bombing. Another grievous instance of police brutality carried out against our own people in our own neighborhood. And so today, I not only want to hear your stories, but I want to recommit myself to the fight for justice. I don't want this trauma our community has experienced to be in vain. We as city leaders need to use our power and our voices to prevent anything like this from happening anywhere in our city ever again. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gaudier. Um, are there any other members of the committee that wish to have opening comments on uh, resolution number 200397? Hearing none, are there any a chat feature, Ms. Williams? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, would you please read the first, the names of the first panel to testify? The first panel witnesses to testify will be Reverend Mark Tyler, Beji Genty, Dr. Elizabeth Bosch, Dr. Damon Jones, and Kawaya Power, um, you can turn your video on at this time and we will uh, hear from Reverend Mark Tyler first. Good afternoon, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mark Kelly Tyler, Senior Pastor of Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. On the, on the evening of Sunday, May 31st, 2020, I received an urgent message that clergy were needed at 52nd and Market Street. We sought to serve as unofficial protest monitors to protect the people as we had done the night before in Center City. In Center City on that night on Saturday, police officers stood and took a laid back attitude, even though multiple stores were being openly looted. I don't recall seeing any police officers that night in riot gear. Yet the next day was totally different on the 31st. I knew something had changed when I got close to 51st and Market on my motorcycle and almost fell when I rode through the residue of tear gas. It was so strong that my eyes instinctively shut tight, causing me to almost slip on the gravel. Once I pulled myself together, I parked and met the other clergy on the corner of 51st and Chestnut. To meet them, I had to pass a virtual wall of police officers in full riot gear, holding the corner of 51st and Market Streets. Nobody could pass. As I took in the scene, the citizens were mostly upset that such a buildup of force was being made and interfering with what was otherwise a beautiful day. All up and down the streets on that day, families who had been locked up and locked in the house due to COVID-19 were sitting outside, finally able to get fresh air. As clergy, we moved down the block on Chestnut toward 52nd, never getting more than a half a block away or close. To our right, a family was celebrating a birthday of a child on their stoop. We could see that on the other side of 52nd and Chestnut, volleys of tear gas started firing into what appeared to be a retail store. A few moments later, a couple dozen people came running out of the building. At that point, volleys of tear gas, which I captured on my Facebook Live, one fell right through my legs, started falling in our midst. There was no warning, not one warning, no announcement, and no provocation. Aside from the maybe 50 to 100 protesters in our cells that were scattered on the long block of Chestnut between 52nd and 51st, all who were really just watching, the only other persons were residents sitting outside, largely ignoring everything that was going on. Let me be clear that the only acts of violence that I witnessed on that day were acts committed by the Philadelphia Police Department in a manner consistent with what we all witnessed on video the following day on Interstate 676, the excessive force, excessive use of force was uncalled for. There was no regard in the 52nd Street corridor for the thousands of residents who were simply trying to live in peace as tear gas and tanks took over their streets. I can't imagine ever seeing a similar scene in the neighborhood where I pastor in Society Hill. Finally, the saddest part of the entire Sunday evening for me is that most of the residents on their stoops never even protested the police buildup. They went on about their lives as though nothing was happening. 
And I believe that it's because we so normalized over policing in the black community that we now take for granted tanks driving on our streets, tear gas in our front yards, and riot gear clad police officers cussing out our children. This is one, just one of the many issues that happened on that week. And so I'm just happy that the committee has opened itself up today to hear our stories. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and just thank you. Who's next and... Baji Genti. I apologize if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. And please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. My name is Baji Genti. I'm 32 years old, black male. I have lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for 20 years. I'm Haitian. I have three kids. On, my, on May 31st, 2020, on 52nd and Market Street, I left my house around like 2 o'clock. I was coming from Reno Street, not too far from 52nd and Market. I had my Black Lives Matter poster in my hand, and I was walking towards Market Street. When I got to Market Street, there were several police officers at each corner of the streets, and there were multiple people in the streets with signs. I'm sorry with signed as well. Every, everything was fine at first. People were conversating among each other about what happened to George Floyd on May 25th and the other killing of black people that happened all over the world just this year alone and how it seems like it will never end. We were protesting for our children's future, so hopefully they won't ever have to go through something like this ever again i'm sorry never have to go something like this in our great country after 20 minutes five police vans pull up police officer hop out with baton calling us our names calling us the n-words calling us monkeys telling us to go back where we come from africa it took me five minutes to really process what the police officers were saying and all I kept hearing was the police officers call us, calling us the N-word. And the protesters were getting upset. And they started filming, feeling offended by the racial slur coming from the police officers. Protesters started, started pulling out their phones and they started recording. And the protesting began to Black Lives Matter and no justice, no peace. The police officers started pushing us and everyone towards the McDonald's and the police officers form a line against us and they were ready to attack us all. Then the lady whispered in my ear, you see the line they forming against, they planning to attack the crowd. crowd. I stood on a stool that was in the streets and I stood with my hand, my right hand up, fist up in the sky, my head down. I probably stood on the stool for like seven minutes with my fist in the air, talking to a police officer who appears to be a captain because he had on a collar shirt on. I was asking him to protect us and asking the protesters to take a knee. I said, the protectors are afraid of what y'all might do. As a black man in America, black woman, black fathers, black son, black daughter if we are black period in america we are afraid of what your police officer might do to us i stood tall to him and i put my right fist back in the air and my head down one of a sudden i got hit with a rubber bullet i began walking to a police officer and i got hit with his baton i didn't notice that the um, truck had pulled up next to me while my head was down I was pepper spray. Everyone was running for, for their lives. Everyone was scared. My shoulder was dislocated and I was, ha and I was ha having several chest pain. I am still black in America and I'm still fearful for my children. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Dr. Elizabeth Bosch. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Boge. Um, I'm going to be talking about the same uh, day and evening. So my husband and I are both physicians and who live in West Philadelphia. And late on the afternoon of May 31st, 
We were told by a friend that there was multiple people who were hurt at the protest at 52nd Street and Walnut, and that they were putting, pulling out a call for help because there was a concern that they weren't seeking help through traditional uh, uh, channels because of fear of uh, engaging them. So they contacted me specifically because in addition to being a physician, I'm a member of the Medical Reserve Corps, an EMT, and was a first responder at 9-11. <coughs> Um, so my husband and I first put on our scrubs so that we could be more easily identified as medical personnel. Um, and we went directly to the corner of 52nd and Walnut. When we got there, uh, things were not actually that tense. We walked right up to the group of police officers, introduced ourselves, um, asked if they knew of any way that we could help. Um, we were told by them that um, everyone was okay. They thanked us, acknowledged, and acknowledged that we said we were going to stay there in case there was other concerns uh, for people's safety and health. Um, there really was very calm at that point. There wasn't much going on. Um, the only traffic that was blocked by anybody um, was the uh, the police cars, uh, including the, the tank on 52nd Street. Cars were still very easily going through Walnut Street and all the surrounding streets. Um, there were a couple of people running in and out of um, a few of the stores, the Sunray Drugstore on the corner there. Um, but the police didn't seem to notice or intervene the people running in and out of the, the stores. Um, there, things were quite calm. There's only about 75 people that were milling about, very occasionally shouting slogans um, and holding signs, but really most people were just standing around very calmly observing. Um, there had been that day announced the 6 p.m. curfew, um, but we were there um, well before and well after the 6 p.m. curfew, and there was absolutely no acknowledgement, no announcement from any of the authorities. Um, my husband and I had a very good view of everything, and we were quite close um, as we were specifically keeping an eye on things um, from the whole area for people that uh, needed help. Um, after things had been quite calm like that for quite some time, um, there was no warning, no announcement, no request to leave, no interactions with the protesters the, that we could see. The police started shooting metal tear gas canisters into the crowd, um, which at that point, as I said, was just people walking around in very small dispersed groups, mainly on street corners. Um, uh, I estimate that there was about two dozen canisters that were shot south down 52nd Street towards Walnut. Um, and after the fact, just to get a sense of how big these are that are flying through the air, multiple stories into the, the air um, without being aimed. So this, if you're running away from it, this is what you're running away from without being able to see it coming. Um, they were uh, multiple people who we treated who had um, cuts, burns, especially people that uh, were running blinded by the gas through the broken glass on the street that had already been there. Um, there were people that were trying to contain the canisters, especially after it became evident that they were um, affecting people uh, beyond just the protesters. Um, some people got hurt that way too. When the police would notice that people were trying to contain the tear gas, um, uh, usually by placing cans or cones or trying to move them away from the more populated areas, um, there were several rounds of rubber billet bullets shot at that point that we observed. Um, we were working with a medical student who had also come dressed, identified as medical personnel. Um, she was very clearly marked as a medic uh, and she was shot uh, with a rubber bullet in the leg while dragging someone out from the broken glass um, while uh, the person was disoriented from the tear gas. Um, the police shot dozens of tear gas canisters. They go a few stories high into the air. Um, they shot them both into the crowd and well beyond the crowd behind us, also in front of us. So everyone who was there had to run through an area that was covered in tear gas and was actively raining down those tear gas canisters in order to leave an area that was affected by tear gas. Um, about, half the cran about half the crowd ran away down um, 52nd Street west towards Walnut Street, um, which is the direction that we went in. And that immediately becomes a family residential neighborhood of, of row homes. The, we saw tear gas canisters land well within what is a mostly black residential part of the neighborhood. No protesters had been anywhere near those houses. It had never been a part of the active police presence, active protesting. Um, while we were there treating some of the protesters who had got caught in this ring of impenetrable tear gas that you had to run through, um, we noticed that um, a black woman ran out of one of the houses in front of us um, carrying her crying daughter, who looked like she was about six years old. 
Um, she told me that a canister had landed on the roof of their front porch, um, so on the right below their second story windows, and the tear gas had been going right into the second story windows uh, of her house. Um, it had gotten in this child's eyes, we, and we looked up, we could see the tear gas can canister still smoking into the windows of her house. Um, the little girl was barefoot. She was crying, screaming. She had a cl wet cloth uh, pressed up to her face where her the family had tried to help her. Um, she We irrigated her eyes to try to get the tear gas out as best as we could to calm her down. She thought that she had been permanently blinded and was never going to be able to see and was um, screaming uh, at the top of her lungs and crying. Um, she continued to scream as we tried to treat her. Um, then the other children who lived in the house started pouring out of the house. There was another little barefoot girl about her age, a toddler who was wearing just shorts who had clearly uh, looked how we'd been asleep, a little boy holding an older man's hand um, who were all affected to a lesser degree. Um, the affected, the most affected girl who had been the first to come out um, was still screaming and was inconsolable. She was so traumatized. Um, I offered to call an ambulance, try to find someone to take her to an emergency room, um, if nothing else, just to get checked out and document what had happened. Um, her, her mom was too scared to engage any of the authorities at that point. Um, and she took off running um, west, farther west, and mentioned that she was going to go to her uncle's house to see if they could take refuge there. Um, and this was on the 5200 block of Walnut Street. Um, I was told later after reconnecting with the family that what happened was there had been actually an infant sleeping in that room that was the most affected where the tear gas was pouring into. And this little girl was the first to recognize that that infant was sleeping in that room. And the reason that she was so much more affected than her siblings is she had run in there and she had uh, become overcome by the tear gas trying to remove her infant sister uh, from the contaminated air. Um, and eventually the the uh, adults had come in, obviously, and had taken both of them out of them out of the the room. Uh, multiple other households from that same block were uh, actively evacuating as well, including a number of elderly people. I saw people who clearly had mobility issues, and the protesters who had just recovered from their own tear gas exposure were helping them down stoops, out of driveways, um, trying to get out of an area. But there was a lot of uncertainty about if there would continue to be more tear gas in the area. So. People were really caught between staying in their house and deciding to move. Um, they were shouting down to us, asking if there were, if there was going to be more. Um, from what we could see, we had a, quite a good view down um, down Walnut Street. Um, there were no police anywhere in this area. They did not even have a line of sight to what the tear gas canisters, where they were landing, and who they were affecting, because um, it was around the corner from where they are. Um, so we were, people were so traumatized and asking, you know, is there going to be more what, what's happening? We, in our scrub, started walking back towards the, the police that were closer to the corner of 52nd and Walnut, um, you know, to, you know, telling them, you're, it's, you know, stop it. There's kids here. You have, you know, please don't know more. Um, but we, uh, we walked up at, to the corner and there was police in, in full riot gear with um, weapons and they started gesticulating back at us. And we got very scared um, that they were going to, um, uh, there was going to be a, aggression on their part. And so we weren't able to give our message of saying, you know, please stop, you're affecting the children. And we turned around and, and walked farther west on Walnut as well. Um, so we were really just appalled by the aggression that was unleashed by the police um, on this residential neighborhood with a completely undangerous, unthreatening group of protesters. Um, the actions of the police escalated this peaceful situation and clearly injured children who are doing nothing but sleeping at home in their own beds. Um, there was really no danger to overcome, no aggression to diffuse, and it really, having been there, remains totally inconceivable to me how the use of tear gas was even considered under these circumstances, um, let alone approved for this use. Um, as you may know, the use of tear gas as a chemical weapon has been banned in war warfare under the Geneva Protocol nearly 100 years ago, um, and then specifically again by the UN's Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997. So this clearly underscores the danger of this chemical weapon, which can have permanent effects even in adults. For obvious reasons, the long-term effects of tear gas on children 
like these poor neighbors of ours have never been fully studied, but reports indicate there can be permanent damage to the developing lungs. And I think what really underscored it from being there and hearing this young girl screaming is quantifying the psychological trauma for a child to be trapped in their own room, surrounded by a noxious chemical weapon. The physical and psychological effects of these less than lethal, lethal weapons are clearly significant and all the more so for the developing brains and lungs of children and babies. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And I'm sorry for the trauma you went through. I wanna thank my members because I can see your faces breaking out in words. I, I know you well enough to know, um, but we wanna try to get as many of these important testimonies on the record as possible. Um, thank you, Ms. Williams, who's next? Dr. Damon Jones. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, name is Dr. Damon B. Jones, Sr. Uh, good afternoon, members of council, and thank you for affording me the opportunity to present my testimony today. For the last 26 years, I have served and continue to serve as a senior pastor of the Bible Way Baptist Church located in the 1300 block of North 52nd Street in West Philadelphia. On May 31st, 2020, I received a call that there was, and I quote, a lot of trouble down on 52nd Street. My 17-year-old son, Dominic, and I drove to the area to see what the problem was and to make myself available as a community leader and clergy person should the need arise. Upon exiting the car a block or so south of the McDonald's, we were immediately adversely affected by tear gas lingering in the air. There were crowds of people peacefully gathered observing the sight of at least one large platoon of Philadelphia police officers lined up in the middle of 52nd Street adjacent to the McDonald's in full riot attire. We noticed two black armored tanks in the street as well. We began hearing loud blasts and quickly realized that the police were firing tear gas canisters indiscriminately into the crowd, causing us to run a few times. While I am a young man of just 54 years old, it's been quite a while since I've had to run from anything or anybody. My eyes were burning and for a while I could not open them as I walked with my son to hold on to. Thankfully, my son was with me that day. What was disturbing to me was that the police were firing tear gas canisters into a, a peaceful crowd of protesters and spectators. Me and my son, along with a few other clergy persons who arrived on the scene, and many neighbors, including young people, were standing peacefully to protest and to watch whatever this was unfold. I should note that the sneaker store across from McDonald's was being looted in plain sight and just feet away from a platoon of officers with absolutely no response from the police officers on the scene. Instead, the officers in the tank were focused on firing tear gas and rubber bullets into a peaceful crowd of spectators, which they did multiple times. Even more disturbing to me was not only the danger my son and I and these peaceful spectators were subjected to at the hands of the police, but I could not help but wonder about the potential danger of those innocent residents in that area were, su were subjected to who may have had their windows open or who may have just been sitting on their porches enjoying the warm day after being quarantined by COVID. I should also note that while an unusually large amount of officers gathered at 52nd and Chestnut, there was not one officer present at the shopping center at 52nd and Jefferson to interrupt the destruction happening there for hours upon hours. And I know this because I went there also. I must say I felt endangered, violated, and disrespected. My life matters, my son's life matters, and black lives matter. I was born and raised in West Philadelphia, and though I no longer live there, I love West Philadelphia, and I still work there in that community every single day. I'm a former president of the Philadelphia Police Clergy Program in the 19th Police District, and I am pro-police, but I am anti-bad cop. The police response I observed on that day was completely unnecessary in my view. I've spent nearly 27 years supporting the police, the district attorney's office, my own community, escorting at least five homicide fugitives in at their request and trying to improve police community relations. But the police response on that day was totally unjustified, in my opinion, and I am sure this would have never occurred in areas bereft of people of color. My son, 17-year-old Dominic, said, 
I felt like this was a movie or a video game. It was unreal. It looked like the military was riding through the streets, tear gassing innocent bystanders. The police were extremely aggressive. They should have been aggressive with the looters, but not with the bystanders. Common sense will tell you that people will gather to watch if you roll out tanks in the middle of 52nd Street. That is a clear divide in terms of us against them, and the police are clearly no longer there to protect and serve. I've always taught my sons to respect law enforcement, but it's difficult when law enforcement has no respect for African Americans. My son's recollection represents the trauma he and I received on May 31st, 2020. The current climate demands that council act and act now. The time to act is, is, is on serious, aggressive police reform is now. The time to defund the police department is now. The time to demilitarize the police is now. Police actions like what we witnessed on May 31st, 2020, not only increase the divide between the police and the community, but threaten the safety and the well-being of our city in which you were all elected to serve. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Williams. Uh, Kawaya Powers. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you say your name for the record and begin your testimony? Uh, Kawaya Powers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kawaya Powers. I am, I am an 11th grader at Science Leadership Academy at Bieber and a member of the Philadelphia Student Union, and as well as the Philadelphia Youth Commission, a part of, as part of Councilwoman Brooks' office. I want to share what happened to me and my friend in front of 440 on June 1st. We were walking home after a protest. The city established a curfew, and people were supposed to be on their way home. What word? The ride is ready. The ride is ready. And, and we were on our way home at the time. Trains didn't go to City Hall, so we needed to walk to Gerard Station. When we were walking, two guys, one on a, on a bicycle and another on a motorcycle, tried to get through a police barricade. We then saw a police officer stick a baton in the front wheel of the bicycle, and the rider flipped off of it. The guy on the motorcycle turned around. I remember telling him, to go and the police caught uh, and the police caught him and flipped him off of his bike. Then we saw the police beat him. Another cop approached us, approached us while waving a metal baton, telling us to cross the street. It was hard to see that happen. Since we were since we were there to protest police injustice. To see that it's like you protested for nothing. After that incident I never wanted to be around the police. It was a it was a hard thing to go through. I never imagined I would see something like that. It was shocking. It said the police are supposed to protect us, but I genuinely can't believe that from what I saw with my own eyes. Not on TV or Instagram. I will never I will never forget that day. It's forever seared into my brain. It will have it will have a, neg a negative impact not just on me as a black youth, but on everybody. You see that, you see this on Instagram, but you never think you'll see it in real life. But I did, but I did. And now, oh, sorry guys. <laughs> and now I know these police interactions happen to many people. I could feel the man's pain when the police hit him. It felt like we were going to be the, we, we were the ones getting hit. It was hard to breathe and we were in tears. We were just baffled. None of, none of my friends have mentioned having these kinds of interactions with the police to me. But that's not to say it hasn't happened. For example, on Instagram, I saw a young person from Philly hit by a rubber bullet in her head. There were... There was a lot of blood, and it made me not want to protest. But I know I have to do something. The day after, this young woman went back out to go protesting, and it inspired me. It made me want to go harder for my community. I want to see less police on our blocks, in our schools, and on SEPTA. We see police officers way too often. 
I know this city is going through much going through much violence right now and it's hard to cope. But we need to come together and find another way to watch our city without having so many police surrounding us. There's no way for them to uh sorry. There's no reason for them to drive slowly down my block. Like they're suspicious of black residents. They put a command center in the middle of Alani Transportation Center and every station you're at, there's a cop with you. At the Philadelphia Student Union, we believe the school district should redirect the money it uses on police to have community members support us in our schools. Community members are the people we trust more than police officers. They see the things we go through growing up in Philadelphia. Many students are dealing with depression and anxiety. There, there are things that weigh us down, but cops don't want to deal with that. They are just at, they are just at school and in our community waiting for something to happen. Community members, on the other hand, can talk to students, like a second guidance counselor. That's what I want to see more of in our schools and neighborhoods. More people we trust. Thank you for your time. Young lady, I'm going to tell your principal that he did a good job on you. You are articulate and to the point. And um, Chris, Chris would be proud of you. Hopefully he heard you. Um, Ms. I mean, Ms. Williams, who's next to testify? Um, before we move on to the next panel, um, Councilman Johnson has his hand raised. Um, did you want to be recognized? I always going to recognize my member and keep in mind that we have 30 plus witnesses. Go ahead, Councilman, Council Member. Council Member Johnson. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I'm recognizing you. That was excellent, sir. I apologize. <laughs> All right, no, no apology necessary. Ms. Williams. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next panel, um, those who just. You having some audio problems, connectivity problems? So. Um, should council. Yeah, Council should, Chair, should Nick step in for a moment? Would you please? Oh. Sam? I'm back. She's back. I got this kid right, I <laughs> um, Let's call up the second panel. Um, I was just saying, members of the first panel, if you need to disconnect, um, please feel free. Uh, the second panel is Reverend Abby Tennis, Judith Palmer, Sergio Sia, Emily Neal, and Shakira King. Thank you guys for your patience and state your name and begin your testimony, please. Hi, my name is Reverend Abby Tennis. I wanted to thank you all, all of the city council members for inviting me and all of the others who are here to share our stories about what happened on the weekend of May 31st, um, particularly up on the West Philadelphia um, 52nd Street corridor. I live with my partner two blocks from 52nd Street on South 50th, and this part of West Philly is my neighborhood. I also serve as the lead minister at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia in Center City, and I serve as one of the co-chairs of the Power Interfaith Coalition's Clergy Caucus. On May 31st, after I finished leading virtual worship services from my living room right here, um, a neighbor and a congregant told me that something was going on between our neighbors and the police at 52nd and Market. After reaching out to some of the other interfaith clergy and inviting them to join me, I walked up through Malcolm X Park towards 52nd Street. My goal was to bear witness to the police presence in our neighborhood and to connect with my neighbors where I could and to use my visible presence as a clergy person and particularly as a white woman clergy person to try to de-escalate police violence if that was needed. As I walked up to 52nd Street, I joined a few dozen other neighbors at 52nd and Spruce looking north and trying to get a sense of what was going on while also remaining at a safe distance. Within about two minutes, I noticed a large dull black 
armored truck that others have called a tank here. I called it a tank that day. There was a large police presence and there was a number of fire trucks a couple of blocks north of us on 52nd Street. Within another four minutes, the black armored truck and other police were moving towards the group of bystanders that I was with and shooting tear gas canisters towards us as we simply stood by and watched from several blocks away. At that point, most of the group of bystanders I was with ran south down 52nd Street to get away from the tear gas. My colleague, Reverend Hannah Capaldi, and I didn't run fast enough at first, and I received enough tear gas to my face that I couldn't see. I was coughing, and tears and mucus were streaming down my face. I was luckily able to stumble back to Malcolm X Park and wait in the breeze until my eyes and my nose and my mouth cleared out. After both of us had mostly recovered, we decided to return to 52nd Street and were eventually joined by four other clergy colleagues from various faith traditions, including Reverend Mark Tyler, who spoke earlier. We moved north as far up as Chestnut Street before needing to, to run east down Chestnut towards 51st um, to narrowly avoid being shot by the police with tear gas canisters. And someone before showed one of the ones that she had picked up. This is the one that I picked up um, afterwards that day. There, there were a number of different sizes and shapes, and all of them were uh, lethal. Over the next two or three hours, um, we were repeatedly shot at with tear gas canisters too many times to count. While I got better at running away, we saw others who were in agony from receiving full blasts of tear gas and who needed to be treated by street medics. I wanna be clear that throughout the afternoon and evening, the police were targeting bystanders with hundreds of rounds of tear gas. And I wanna be clear that this happened in a residential neighborhood on a beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon. Over that afternoon, this is what I saw. The police shot tear gas near children picnicking in Malcolm X Park with their families. The police shot tear gas past elders who were holding themselves up with their canes as they stood outside their homes on 52nd Street. The police shot dozens of rounds of tear gas past a whole large family trying to hold a birthday party on their porch on Chestnut Street with music and food and balloons and streamers. The police shot tear gas towards people sitting in their wheelchairs outside of their homes on both Chestnut Street and Walnut Street, trying to get some sun and fresh air on a nice day and with absolutely no ability to run away. The police shot tear gas past toddlers and mothers standing on their second and third floor porches on Walnut Street. And I wanna be really crystal clear that this happened in a black neighborhood. There are white people like myself and people of other racial identities who live here, but the vast majority of my neighborhood is black. The vast majority of the police force that I saw that day were white. This kind of police violence and disregard for the safety of an entire residential neighborhood does not happen in white neighborhoods. In a week where armed vigilantes in white neighborhoods in Philadelphia were receiving high fives from the police, black children and black elders and black people in wheelchairs and black families were being indiscriminately tear gassed in my neighborhood. As a resident of West Philadelphia, as a human being who knows that lives matter more than property, as a white person who believes with all her soul that black lives matter, and as a clergy person who has devoted her life to honoring the inherent worth and dignity of all people, I ask that city council take forceful action to make sure that this never ever happens again. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for being there that night, that day. Uh, Shakira King. Thank you, Ms. King. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Name is Shakira King. I am a West Philadelphia native, um, and I have organized um, in the city of Philadelphia for a number of years. I'm also a true and blue Philly native. Um, I often call myself a join, um, lovingly, in the best of ways. Um, and here is my account of what happened on May 20, Sunday, May 29th. Um, all of my life, too many times, I have been impacted directly by police violence 
by the hands of the Philadelphia Police Department. I remember that day clearly. It was a Sunday afternoon and the night before the city had just been on fire. Many of my friends were in the thick of it that day, so I spent the night on the phone ensuring my, my folks were safe. I woke up from a nap hearing helicopters and my neighborhood citizens app telling me that there was a cop car on fire at 52nd and Market. From the video that the app provided, no car was on fire. People were just standing in front of the Rainbow Clothing Store watching the car sit there undamaged. I decided I would go up to 52nd and Walnut, which wasn't far from my home. When I got there, I saw two friends that told me that a young man had just been assaulted very badly by the police. His face was bleeding and his friends took him home. I asked if there was any particular reason and they told me no. They just started beating him. And when they stopped, his friends rushed him home. We decided to stand in front of Hakeem's bookstore, which is the oldest black owned bookstore in the city of Philadelphia. Once we got there, there were just a, young, a bunch of young people standing around. No one was getting hurt. No one was in, in immediate danger. Yes, people were looting, and I mean looting loosely. Um, but to be fair, they had been in the house for months. The government, both local and federal, weren't doing anything to provide relief. And the city couldn't even get Comcast, which paid no income taxes in the city of Philadelphia and has two large buildings in the city of Philadelphia to give its residents free Wi-Fi. I saw people coming out of the stores that were on the strip and what they had in their hands were soap, diapers, formula. A number of the black owned businesses on that street had not been touched. So when the helicopters began to circle, we kept standing. Some people began playing music. Most people were standing there talking again no one was in immediate danger. I'm not sure how the fire got started on the corner or who opened the pharmacy on the corner. But what I do remember is the people rushing into the store and then the fire truck pulling up. Once the fire truck got to the corner, two SWAT trucks sped down the street and stopped on the corner. We were standing there still waiting to see what would happen, making sure no harm came to the bookstore. That was our main concern. And suddenly a SWAT officer gets out of the back of the SWAT, SWAT vehicle, excuse me, without a warning shot, without warning language, he aimed the tear gas canister directly at me because I was standing in the middle of the block, shot one into the air and another directly at us. Um, like Reverend Abby said, I could not outrun the tear gas canister and immediately felt the sting of tear gas in my lungs and eyes. I sped down an adjacent block where my friends lived and went directly into their apartment and began first washing, making sure they wash their faces and hands. Then rushed to the window and made sure that the neighbors also knew to wash their faces and hands. Once the initial sting went away and I was able to take care of myself, we went back outside to check on others who were out there with us. As we made our way down the blocks, we told the older folks who had been sitting on their porches to go inside and close their windows. We were sure that more tear gas and SWAT cars were going to come. As I continue to reflect on the weight of that experience, I am reminded of how some 50 plus years ago, folks on Osage Avenue um, must have felt the same. These kinds of super violent attacks help no one, especially when a community community is consistently underserved and has to rely on itself to stay safe. I hope, my hope is that this is not, not only does this never happen again, excuse me, but that Philadelphia's local government will no longer support the increasing of a budget to allow things like SWAT cars and tear gas guns to be purchased before its citizens have schools that function properly, affordable housing, and access to affordable health care. Does that conclude your testimony? Yes, sir. Thank you for that testimony. Ms. Williams. Judith Palmer. Good afternoon. My name is Judith Palmer. I live in Cobbs Creek. 
On the afternoon of May 31st, I learned of a large police presence on 52nd Street. Having heard about the extreme use of force by police at protests earlier that weekend, I decided to be a witness in case the situation on 52nd Street escalated. I left my home on 54th and Catherine at around 4.45 p.m. And shortly after, I saw a large armored tank travel down 52nd Street toward Locust Street. As I was recording, two officers approached me. One officer looked at me recording and then without warning, shot me in the leg with a rubber bullet. No one in the area was engaged in dangerous or disruptive activities. I was afraid that I would be shot again if I continued to document police activity, so I returned home. The bullet left a lump that continued for several weeks and was still visible three months later. The police cannot be trusted with weapons like pepper spray and rubber bullets or any tactics banned by international law and they should surrender all military hardware obtained through the Department of Defense. We are not enemy combatants. Moreover, the city is responsible for holding police accountable. We need drastically increased transparency about complaints against police and subsequent investigations. And we need the city to prioritize preparations for grievance arbitration, where violent cops so often get discipline overturned. And for interest arbitration, where police pile up protections and loopholes that benefit them at the expense of the residents of Philadelphia. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Williams. Sergio Sia. Uh, Good afternoon, council members. Uh, My name is Sergio Sia, and I'm a Democratic committee person serving in West Philadelphia's 46th Ward not far from where I was tear tear gassed by police um, while riding uh, my bike. No warning was given before the police advanced violently on May 31st. I was only made aware as I saw dozens of people fleeing past me. I saw an armored vehicle descend down 52nd Street accompanied by rubber bullet gunshots going off indiscriminately and plumes of chemical weapons going everywhere. Cars with unaware passengers stuck on 52nd Street had to quickly roll up their windows as their vehicles filled with tear gas. A helicopter loudly hovered above, making its gaze known. I tried to escape to a residential block on 52nd Street in Delancey, where there were no protesters. Still, police shot a tear gas canister down this block near me. My vision got really bad at this point, and I stumbled or hit things while biking and fell over several times. A stranger saw me and rinsed out my eyes and gave me water to drink in a nearby park, which was Malcolm X. Uh, I could see police advancing down 52nd Street, continuing to shoot tear gas. People walking their dog or otherwise enjoying the park fled terrified. Uh, As I left, I I biked past a stranger rinsing out the eyes of a mother and child on 51st and Larchwood. My lungs still burned when I got home and bothered me for hours. A fellow committee person was shot by police with a rubber bullet in her leg, that was Judith. Uh, She sent me pictures of the armored vehicle I had seen and the bruise left on her leg. Another committee person had also been shot at close range with a rubber bullet by the police. This incident has left me and my community feeling traumatized. The disdain and lack of compassion for the violence imposed on a black majority community was underscored when less than a month later, Kenny and Outlaw apologized for what happened to protesters on I-676 and made it seem like the people harmed in West Philadelphia deserved it. Here are changes I'd like to see. A new vision for de-escalating crowds with roles for transparent communication to inform citizens about the intentions of police and train mediators to listen to the demands of protesters. Demilitarization of the police department and an end to chemical weapons and rubber bullets being used on residents. We need greater transparency about what police are doing. We need real discipline for police who behave badly. Those who made the orders to deploy chemical agents in in a residential neighborhood should resign or be fired. We also need higher expectations for what the city can do and their role managing the police. They need to hold police accountable and they fail to do so when they agree to bad contracts with the FOP. We all have a role in reimagining what a police, what policing and accountability should look like. Uh, so I thank you for creating this space and listening to my testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Williams. Emily Neal. Ms. Neal. Yes. Hello. Uh, Emily Neal. 
Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you city council members for inviting me here today to share what I witnessed and experienced on May 31st in West Philadelphia. My name is Emily Neal and I live in council member Gautier's district in West Philadelphia. I have lived and worked in Philadelphia as a journalist since January, 2018. I care deeply about the city that I've come to call home and I'm passionate about the importance of local and community driven journalism in shaping its future. My instinct and commitment as a journalist is what led me to be present as a freelance unaffiliated reporter at the events occurring on 52nd Street in West Philadelphia on May 31st. I walked about 10 minutes from where I live to arrive on the scene with a DSLR camera and my phone at around 5 o'clock p.m. At 52nd and Chestnut Streets, I observed a crowd of people and a large police presence. Several minutes after I arrived, an armored vehicle came from behind the police barricade at the intersection of 52nd and Chestnut Streets, and police began to fire tear gas indiscriminately from the vehicle. Along with many other people gathered there, I ran down 52nd Street towards Sampson Street in an effort to avoid the tear gas. Minutes later, I walked back towards Chestnut Street. There were very few people there. I turned left of the corner onto Chestnut Street. I and another man who was 10 feet or so to my left began to record as three police officers were arresting someone on the other side of the street. Another officer in a SWAT uniform was walking back and forth near the officers making the arrest. The man to my left told police that he was recording asking them not to shoot us because we were recording. There was no one else on the sidewalk in that immediate area where we were standing. A police officer or officers who were in SWAT uniforms opened fire with rubber bullets, shooting first at the man to my left who was recording and then at myself. I immediately began to run towards the corner of Chestnut and 52nd Streets in order to turn the corner onto 52nd Street and run towards Sampson Street away from the police. I was struck on my backside as I was running and I saw that the rubber bullets were both behind me and in front of me. When I realized that I might be running forward into more rubber bullets, I inst instinctively sought to protect myself by diving towards the ground. As I did so, I was struck in the head. I laid on the ground for a moment and I quickly realized I was bleeding profuse, profusely from my head. The man who had been recording stopped to help me and another bystander came to my aid and they applied pressure to the wound. They helped me around the corner where I sat down and they then asked if I could stand up and walk towards Samson as they thought that the police were going to fire more tear gas. They helped me walk to Samson Street where a doctor on the scene examined my wounds and kept me sitting down until the ambulance arrived. I was taken to Jefferson University Hospital and received eight stitches in my forehead. I discovered another wound underneath my hair that evening after I got home from the hospital. In the week following, I had severe headaches and head pain and had difficulty reading and writing. In the months following the incident, I have experienced episodes of panic and anxiety as a result of specific triggers which remind me of the event. I remember speaking with a medical professional after the event. He asked me as he removed my stitches about what happened. He is black and in response to what I related, he said, thank you for being there, but just know that you stepped into a moment of what for others is a lifetime. I can think of no better way to contextualize my experience as a white Philadelphian. And I ask you, the members of city council, to consider this testimony of a moment of what I experienced as indicative of what for black Philadelphians is a lifetime. I would ask city council to consider that the use of less lethal force, including rubber bullets and tear gas, can result in lifelong physical and psychological damage. I would also ask the members of city council to consider that the protection of First Amendment rights for credentialed journalists, unaffiliated journalists, and each and every civilian who seeks to lawfully and peacefully exercise their constitutional right to record on public property is a pillar of our democracy. 
To target someone exercising that right or for a law enforcement agency to perpetrate and permit attacks on that individual is to violate the most basic tenets of our democracy first put forth in our own city over two centuries ago. Thank you very much for your time and for listening to me today. Thank you for your testimony. We're so sorry for your injuries. Ms. Williams? Um, with that, I will call up the next panel of witnesses to testify. Panel number three will be Amelia Carter, Ryan Bing, Monica Allison, and Tamir Younger. Uh, please turn on your videos if you are on um, on a computer. And we will start with Amelia if you are connected. We want to thank everyone for their patience. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Amelia Carter. I am a resident of 52nd Street and a member of Penn Community for Justice. On May 31st at about 3.30 p.m., I returned to my home on Chancellor Street and was informed by neighbors that police were present in mass for an unknown reason. Suddenly, I saw an elderly woman stumble onto the street who had been hit in the face by a rubber bullet. Dazed, she said she didn't understand why she had been shot. Still unclear about what was happening, I watched as residents maimed by rubber bullets and others who struggled to breathe emerged from the white smoke starting to gather on Walnut Street. Around 4.45 p.m., I saw police officers fire tear gas and rubber bullets at people gathered on the 52nd Street corridor, which started a stampede. A tear gas canister flew over my head and landed one foot in front of me as I turned my back to run. As the gas billowed out and hit my face, seizing my lungs and singing my eyes, I realized I couldn't breathe or see. Thankfully, a volunteer street medic helped flush my eyes with water. Even in the midst of fearing for my safety from police use of excessive and indiscriminate force, I was worried about COVID-19 exposure as I had to remove my now soiled mask and was being coughed on by people in the same condition. As the police continued to shoot gas, I tried to run home to escape the scene, but as I turned onto Chancellor, gas canisters were released on the residential streets, thus hitting me with tear gas again. When I finally reached my home, it was full of tear gas, forcing me to go back outside. The PPD armored vehicles continued moving south on 52nd Street, firing tear gas onto other residential blocks. I witnessed neighbors incapacitated by gas due to bad asthma reactions. It wasn't cops who helped neighbors yelling in the street for assistance. It was other neighbors who were struggling to breathe themselves who came to their aid. At around 6 p.m., I saw police return to Chestnut Street where they released more tear gas at residents on Walnut Street who presented no threat. Throughout the seven hour police occupation, I never heard or saw police attempt to communicate with us or warn us before using tear gas or rubber bullets. I was terrified by what I witnessed that day. It was clear that the Philadelphia Police Department believed they were at war with us. In the name of quote unquote protecting us and our property, they were willing to create a battleground between unarmed residents and they, the militarized police force. Although they arrived on the scene before any looting took place, they didn't prevent any destruction of property and only served to endanger human lives. Today, I am demanding with many people here that the Philadelphia Police Department be forced to demilitarize and be systematically defunded. It is clear they aren't capable of protecting or serving the city. I am disgusted to know that as a taxpayer, this is how my contribution is being spent. I am deeply saddened to see that despite history-making protests demanding justice by way of defunding police, the city council overwhelmingly voted to maintain the bloated police budget. I question the efficacy of processes like these when in action those we vote on into office don't have our backs. I want to know what exactly can be done to defund the PPD and institute police-free alternatives to public safety. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ryan Bing. Mr. Bing, state your name and please yeah. begin your testimony. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Ryan Bing. I'd like to thank everyone who shared or will share their stories tonight. Council members and members of the public, thank you for hearing my testimony regarding the events on and around 52nd Street. I'm an English professor at Community College of Philadelphia, where I am also active in our faculty and staff union, although I should say that I'm giving this testimony as an individual and not as an official spokesperson for the college or our union. I live in West Philadelphia, only a few blocks from 52nd Street. When I decided to join the protests on Sunday, May 31st, it was to stand in solidarity with my neighbors against racism, injustice, and police brutality. What happened that day was a massive police over response of indiscriminate and excessive force against my neighbors and me. I left my house around 4.30 p.m. that day. Just a few minutes later, I smelled tear gas for the first time that day and encountered several people coming from the direction of 52nd Street who were clearly suffering, presumably from having been tear gassed by the police. Some of their eyes were red. Some of them had mucus streaming from their noses down and off their faces. Some were coughing and wincing and at least one person called out in pain. I also saw people providing first aid to those who were suffering. Short while later, I reached 52nd and Chestnut where there was a police line across 52nd Street and a large number of people in the streets and on the sidewalks. Some people were protesting and some people seemed to be merely You have reached the voicemail box of 2673203642. Is that you, Modesto? Please be continue. Oh, sure. A uh, short while later, I reached 52nd and Chestnut, where there was a police line across 52nd Street and a large number of people in the streets and on the sidewalks. Some people were protesting, and some people seemed to be merely observing everything that was going on. Some people were apparently looting the footlocker there and damaging an unoccupied police vehicle. However, I observed no violence against people and did not feel unsafe. I joined a group of protesters and was nonviolently protesting and observing the police. About 10 to 15 minutes after I joined this group of protesters, at least two police officers in riot gear, without giving any warning or order to disperse, threw tear gas canisters into the crowd I was a part of. This crowd was, pre was predominantly people who appeared to be black and included several people who appeared to be teenage children. As I and everyone in the area, except for the police, began moving quickly west on Chestnut away from the police, I was struck by what I believed to be a less lethal munition, which caused me bruising and discomfort for two to three weeks afterwards. I also suffered the effects of the tear gas, and I saw several people in the crowd experience the painful effects of the tear gas. As the group I was a part of attempted to flee the tear gas and less lethal munitions, the police deployed a second volley of tear gas. Even though the crowd was already moving west away from the police, the Foot Locker, and 52nd Street. In addition to the tear gas and less lethal munitions used by the police, social distancing due to COVID-19, which many people had maintained before the police became violent, broke down in the confusion and quick movement of the crowd after the police violence began. I also noticed that several police officers were not wearing masks or were not wearing them properly before and during this incident. I now know what I experienced and witnessed was only one example of the police violence that occurred in my neighborhood that day. I'm disappointed the police used violence against me and violated my civil rights. But more than that, I am angry at the way the city and the police treated my neighbors that day. I am also angry at the way the city and the police have historically treated my neighbors. As you know, the 52nd Street neighborhood is a historically black neighborhood, and West Philadelphia has been the site of repeated police violence and abuse for decades, including the notorious move bombing by police and the subsequent fire that destroyed 65 houses, as well as many, many other smaller scale, but still unacceptable instances of police abuse and brutality against black people, people of color, and members of other marginalized groups. The racist police violence and over-policing needs to end. I ask the city to address this immediately before anyone else is killed or injured. 
Organizations such as the NAACP, the Movement for Black Lives, Black Philly Radical Collective, Amistad Law Project, the Marshall Project, the ACLU, and others offer significant resources and information regarding police reform, criminal justice reform, or police abolition that I believe could serve as a valuable foundation as we decide as a city how to end police brutality and racism and invest in the things that make a city safer, health, education, community, shared prosperity, and justice. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Monica Ma Allison. Ms. Allison. Thank you city council members for listening to our testimony and thank you to all who have testified thus far. My name is Monica Allison and I am a committee person in the third ward, co-founder of the Neighborhood Association and RCO Cobbs Creek Neighbors, longtime West Philadelphia resident and the West Philadelphia coordinator for an early learning literacy program. My testimony today brought every one of those hats together in a culminating set of events. I've been involved in the West Philadelphia area for most of my adult life. I have taken part in meetings, letter writing, and yes, even pre peaceful protests. This is just a snapshot of some of the events that occurred on 52nd Street, and it was out of control and hurtful from a community perspective. While most of us understand that the looting and rioting is not the desired outcome of peaceful protests and that police need the flexibility to be able to respond, the over the top response is and was concerning for neighborhood residents. Tanks and tear gas do not belong in residential areas. It is an offensive outrage that I even need to come to you and say that. It was a beautiful Sunday Many neighbors were venturing outside in their immediate neighborhood. Children were playing and peaceful protesters were marching down Chestnut Street toward 52nd to protest police violence. They were met with rubber bullets, tear gas and tanks from other areas. Literally the thing everyone was out there protesting. The calls I began receiving were regarding the police response to the protests. Again, for the record, looting and rioting is not the answer, but the majority of the protesting was peaceful. Large businesses like ShopRite were looted and never got a response from the police department, but neighborhoods were tear gassed. Neighbors are tired. The, the perception is that our youth were targeted and our neighborhood was targeted. There was no concern for the small streets that flanked the commercial corridor, no concern for elderly or children, those with health issues. None of that was taken into consideration when the tear gas was released. Those are the people we at Cobbs Creek neighbors heard from. There were calls when the SEPTA buses moved into 52nd Street carrying officers and they were asking how can we get them out of the neighborhood because their very presence was creating more problems than before they showed up. The co police created a adversarial position instead of a position of solidarity. I saw a young man try to talk to an officer at the corner of 52nd and Walnut and try to articulate why he felt as he did. He was pushed by the officer and apparently because he just got too close. I watched as the stores along 52nd Street were looted, but the officers concentrated on the protesters. It would have been a simple strategy if saving property was the issue to allow protesters to continue marching away from 52nd Street and protect the corridor and its property if that was the initial intent. The police clearly communicated that we were less than human and the city looked the other way. Who gave the order to use tear gas? The zip code of 19143 has one of the highest populations of seniors in the entire city. No one took them into account when the decision was made. Protesters were unarmed, but were tear gassed. 
as residents, neighbors, and constituents, just as we never want another bomb dropped on us, we never want tear gas used in our neighborhoods. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your responsibility to ensure that these violent police are held accountable. Do not fail us again. We are watching. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for your service to your community. Ms. Williams. Time year younger. Time year younger. Yes, hello. You have reached the voice mailbox of two six seven three two zero three six. Ms. Williams. Time year younger. Are you connected? Samantha, we're having okay. an issue. Um, he can't connect. We tried calling out to his number, but we're receiving a voicemail uh, message. What I'm going to try to do is uh, I'm going to email him and see if he can come in for our conference. Okay. Um, should we? That was the last witness for this panel. Should we move on to the next panel? Yes, and I'm going to allow my... Um, I'm here if you guys. Ms. Kim, this, this, is this the second half? Yes, that is correct. Uh, I do hear someone trying to talk. Is that Chimere? I just heard someone trying to speak, maybe. <laughs> My apologies if that wasn't the case. Um, okay, going back on mute. Uh, <laughs> um, I would like you to assume the uh, chair. Uh, for this, if you would. Absolutely. Are you okay with that? Yes, I am. Here, let me just. I'll still be with you, but. Absolutely. Chairman. Um, Excuse me, Tymir is now on. Excellent. Tymir, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry about all that phone trouble. Are you guys able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Tamir, if you could just uh, state your name for the record and you may proceed with your testimony. And thank you for being uh, so committed to this process. Thank you guys for having me. Um, hello, my name is Tamir. And um, I, I'm i on the 55th block, 55th and Walnut block of Philadelphia. So those events over the weekend, I was able to see a lot of what was going on. One second, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, um, like many people all over the country and here in Philadelphia, I was outraged but not surprised um, about the George Floyd verdict. Um, for some people, that anger did spill out into the street. And, you know, that's anger that comes from constantly being overlooked while at the same time being targeted. So, a lot of people were angry. Um, while I wasn't directly involved in the events that took place over the weekend, I did have to be outside and I live in that area. Like I said, I was affected. Um, I was on my way home that day. I did have to pass through 52nd and Market to get back to my house. Um, while I was outside, um, I did see a lot of police like shoving and just pushing and shouting, making a pen situation even more tense. Um, they didn't really try their best. I don't, I would say to distinguish between who was protesters and who was rioters and who may have just been trying to get home. So everyone kind of was treated the same. And for the people who were outside who weren't doing anything or who were innocent, it's a it's a traumatic experience to go through. Um, I feel like if the police in my neighborhood were more familiar with the people who were in the neighborhood, they were they may be able to better differentiate between who was who in those situations. Um, I also believe that even after the protests and after that weekend, the events of that weekend caused more tension between the police and the residents in my area. Even after it was over, uh, the police, they were more aggressive than they needed to be in, the, in, in my neighborhood. Um, even two months later, when I attended a protest for a completely unrelated issue, um, the police who were there, they made many comments referring back to the protests over that weekend where they were expressing 
eagerness to arrest people and to treat them in the way that they were being treated over the protests over that weekend. So it kind of seems like the people aren't over it, but the police aren't either. Um, I would like to know if there is a way for the police to try to get to know the people in the community better, because I think if they don't, the community is never going to trust them or feel like we need them here to protect us because we don't feel protected. And that was all I had. Thank you so much. We we deeply appreciate your testimony. Um, for the listening audience, that concludes uh, the testimony um, for West Philadelphia. And the next set of testimonies that we will be hearing now will focus primarily on the area around 676. I ask uh, if those who have already testified, you can uh, now disconnect. Um, and if the clerk could please, uh, if the clerk could please call the roll or uh, the next panel together. Thank you. Um, on the next panel, we have George McLeod, Max Hibbard, Kelsey Romano, Jamila Hankinson, and Rachel Udzinski. Thank you, everybody, for for joining us uh, today. I know that this is difficult for many of you, so we deeply appreciate your testimony and your time. Um, Mr. McLeod, would you like to begin your testimony? If you, and if you can please state your name for the record, and then you may begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is George McLeod. Um, I wanna thank the council, council members and uh, all the brave voice, voices who spoke about what happened at 52nd Street. Um, the mayor's office still needs to atone for what happened there. On June 1st, 2020, I was attending a protest in Center City at the police headquarters that became a march to the Vine Street Expressway. I made my way onto the expressway with a friend, Matt Over, with no problem. The cars were honking with the marchers and drivers were throwing their fists up in solidarity with us. When we arrived at an underpass by the Franklin Institute, a stampede occurred, forcing myself and my friend up onto a steep incline to the side of the road. We looked on as three officers engaged with the crowd, mostly under the cover of the tunnel. They pepper sprayed and pointed their weapons at the people on the road. Two of the officers were heavily militarized and showed no sympathy for the unarmed protesters throwing their hands up in defense. There was no clear communication between protesters and law enforcement from what I could tell. Suddenly, my throat started to burn along with my eyes. We realized that tear gas had been deployed. So we escaped to a tall fence around the embankment. My friend and I hoisted people up to get over the fence and safely onto the parkway. The tear gas was oppressive and showed no sign of letting up. People were choking, coughing, and spitting all around me. Just then a body fell from above and hit me with all its weight. My left shoulder dislocated from the impact and I blacked out for a moment. A few people helped me up from the ground and lifted me up the fence. As I was going over the fence, my shoulder popped back into place and a helicopter blared a siren low to the ground. It was all very dystopian. Um, my friend and I got away and safely back to our home in West Philly. I woke up to panic attacks in the weeks following the protest and I continue to be startled by loud noises and sudden movements. I also had an MRI that shows that I need surgery on my shoulder. I don't believe the police handled the situation right, and I don't trust them in the slightest now. I believe that defunding them toward eventual abolition is the only option for our communities to feel safe and protected going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for testifying. Thank you. Next, we have Max Hibbard. Um, hello. <laughs> um, good evening, council members um, and fellow community members. Uh, my name is Maxwell Hibbard. Um, I live in West Philadelphia. I attended Philly Public Schools and I'm now a teacher in the school district of Philadelphia. Um, I'm very proud to have grown up in Philadelphia um, and to be able to give back to my community as a teacher. Um, 
But when I think about how our police responded to the protests, um, I'm I'm heartbroken as a as a Philadelphian. Um, on June 1st, uh, my girlfriend and I joined the protests to march in solidarity with our black friends and neighbors to stand with them and say enough is enough. Something has to change. Some of the protesters decided to march on 676. It was peaceful. Onlookers were cheering. The traffic had stopped. It seemed safe, so we joined them. And when we got onto the highway, there were more people cheering us on, standing outside their cars, um, recording us with their cell phones, joining us in solidarity. But then the police arrived. Um, there were clouds of tear gas, some people running. I saw an officer pepper spray a young woman in the face who was kneeling in peaceful protest. The same officer walked over to my girlfriend who was also kneeling peacefully. He pulled her goggles down and shot pepper spray directly into her eyes. That same officer kicked over another man who was sitting peacefully and he shot pepper spray into his face too. Getting out of there, uh, it was terrifying. Um, Every day, I wake up in the morning and I'm, I'm right there reliving it. My girlfriend's eyes and face are burning. I'm helping her up the hilly embankment because she can barely see. Um, there's innocent people on the ground coughing and wheezing. Smoke bombs, tear gas canisters flying towards us. I got hit in the arm with a rubber bullet. Someone behind me got shot with a rubber bullet and two officers dragged this person down the hill. And I asked myself constantly, why? Like we were running away. We were, we were, we were like, okay, we're, we're running away. <laughs> um, my girlfriend and I were very fortunate. Uh, some protesters helped us over the fence. A few more helped us rinse the pepper spray out of her eyes. And then a couple friends picked us up and drove us home. Every single morning, I have these flashbacks. My heart's racing, my palms are sweating, my knees are shaking. I'll get out of bed and I take a shower and I have another flashback. So when I had to help my girlfriend scr scrub pepper spray out of her eyes, her hair, her eyebrows, we tried to get the stuff out of her eyelashes, um, but everything we did just made it worse. We tried to go to sleep that night, um, but we couldn't because... About 15 blocks north of us, the police are terrorizing our West Philly neighborhood for the second night in a row. Sirens, booms, explosions, random arrests. On the next school day, I had virtual class with my fifth graders. One of them saw a video of me on 676 on social media and sent a chat. He said, he said, I'm sorry for what happened to you and Christina. There were other students that chimed in and said, what happened? What happened? And I had to explain to them that my girlfriend and I were punished for exercising our First Amendment rights. We were punished for saying that Black Lives Matter. All of my students live in West Philly. None of them were able to sleep for two nights in a row. The sirens, explosions, violence, the hatred they heard that night by the police, it was heartbreaking. And the kids weren't even out there protesting. They were in their homes, lying in their beds, shaking in fear. I want a city official to visit every elementary school in West Philly and look every single child in the eye and show them what a genuine apology looks like and sounds like. It is not fair that the mayor would apologize to a group of mostly white protesters on 676 and not apologize to 52nd Street, to West Philly. Look those children in the eye and tell them that what our police did to them and to their families was wrong. Tell them what the city is doing now to restore their trust. I 
I look forward to voting yes on the ballot provision to approve a citizen's police oversight commission. But I worry that it won't have the power and independence that we deserve. We need a fully independent commission with real power to change the way policing happens in Philadelphia. A good start would be if they have the power to subpoena a police officer when there is evidence they have committed a crime against our own people. It would give us a lane to speak truth to power, a room and a time to be seen and heard and believed when people we pay to protect and serve us take advantage of their power and and harm human lives. And this should be done when any city employee commits any violent crime against any of our own people. So I ask us to push legislation that gives the Citizens Police Oversight Commission real power. I want a future in Philadelphia where civilians can apply to become board members and get that real power to make real change to policing. We all, we just want to be safe. We can only be safe if we give our citizens that real power. I appreciate your time and your attention to my story and my voice. And I thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mr. Hibbard. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Kelsey Romano. My name is Kelsey Romano. This is my 11th year teaching special education in Philly. On June 1st, 2020, I joined a gathering of union members for justice for George Floyd. I wore my working educator shirt and was flanked by my colleagues, friends, husband, and a former student. I felt strongly that although this act of civil disobedience was something small, that's how most revolutions succeed. Old archaic systems based in white supremacy that allow and perpetuate the death, maiming and trauma of black, indigenous and people of color are pulled asunder through death by a thousand cuts. Before I left for the protest, my mom, dad, friends and family told me to be safe. Be safe? I've never thrown a rock or broken a window in my life. Now I realize this was my privilege. It was the police. It, it told me the police would see me as peaceful. I would be fine. As I recall the screams and sobs now, I realize how very wrong I was. <laughs> when the tear gas began flooding the street, my husband grabbed my hand and we ran. With police surrounding us, we were forced up a hill and into a 10 foot metal fence. As I stepped onto the hill, I was hit with a less than lethal munition. I screamed and fell to the ground. As I breathe in the gas, I think this is how I die. In my husband, Chris Romano's submitted testimony, he articulates the feeling of tear gas, stating, you feel like you were being strangled to death with lingering after effects such as blurred vision, a swollen and sore abdomen, languishing mental trauma, sleepless nights, loss of appetite, recurring flashbacks, and social anxiety. Separated from my husband, we are led in opposite directions. At the top of the hill, I am bent over, vomiting, when an officer pushes me to the ground and zip ties my hands behind my back. When I realize what is happening, I stand up and ask him if I can get my ID from my bag, which has fallen off. He tells me, you don't get shit. I'm shaking, begging him, please, 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 I just want my ID. What if they arrest me and I claim they don't know who I am and I'm kept longer? disappeared into the roundhouse like so many stories I've heard from my black and brown students. Although I am standing and capable of walking, the officer pushes me to the ground and drags me down the hill backwards over branches and brambles. 
I start to feel like I might not die, only to realize that I'm being arrested. I followed orders, thanked every officer. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The girl next to me asked me to look at her hand. She wants to know what color it is. It's turning purple, I tell her. She tries to ask an officer for help. I ask a little louder. We are laughed at and told that she'll see her in the ICU. When we are loaded onto the white school bus, I feel like I'm in a strange alternative universe. The bus is packed to the brim with women, two to a seat, all without masks. I think about how this was a very unusual experience for me. One that I don't have to live in fear of experiencing again. I notice my privilege in a new and deeper way. I think about how those in West Philly must have felt when the violation was brought to their homes. Even in, even in the police brutality I experience, I am privileged. This reminds me of why I took to the streets, why I have chosen Philadelphia as my home, why I continue to teach in the city that I love and fight for a better future for my students. None of us are free until all of us are free. The dichotomy of this day hurts in a profound way. Returning home to Fishtown only to see our local police sharing pizza and smiles with white vigilantes who claim to be protecting their neighborhood. We took to the streets to echo the names of the lives taken by police brutality and the violence of white supremacy. While Fishtowners shouted racial and homophobic slurs, we shouted the names of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. We mourn the lives of Tamir Rice, and Ayanna Jones, who would have been graduating in the class of 2020. Fish towners were met with patience, understanding, and gratitude. We were met with violence. Philadelphia remains one of the poorest large cities in the nation. With a legacy of redlining, we are also one of the most segregated. The FOP has made it clear that it is not on the side of the people. And as a union member myself, I know the power and purpose of unions. Philadelphia must break ties with the FOP. Police do not belong in schools. They take $31 million annually from services that would benefit our students, such as counselors, social workers, asbestos abatement and building repairs. Police should not be utilizing less than lethal weapons, uh, nor weapons that are banned in international warfare. Police should be held accountable for each and every one of their actions. Qualified immunity and access to these less than le lethal weapons should be ceased. You know the horrors coming out of the White House. You know the horrors that black and brown people face every day from police terrorizing their neighborhoods. You know the history of the Philadelphia Police Department. You have the power to change the narrative. You have the power to vote to defund the police, ban these less than lethal weapons, break ties with the FOP, and get cops out of schools. Let Philadelphia, the birthplace of America, lead by example. To the Philadelphia Police Department, Mayor Kenny and the members of City Council, I ask, who do you protect? Who do you serve? Thank you. Thank you so much for your courageous testimony, Ms. Romano. We really appreciate it, and we know how difficult it was. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Jamila Hankinson. Good evening, City Council members. My name is Camilla Hankinson. I'm here to testify before Council concerning the attack on peaceful protesters, which took place on June 1st on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway and on the Interstate Highway of I-676. Before I begin my testimony, I would like to share with you a bit about myself and the family members I was with that day. I am 50 years old. I am an elementary school teacher with the School District of Philadelphia. I am also an adjunct professor at Community College of Philadelphia. I am one of the elected committee members in the Mighty 51st Ward. I am a graduate of Community College of Philadelphia. I received my bachelor's degree from Temple University, and I have a master's degree from St. Joe's University. I'm a member of the Navy Wives Association, and I fellowship at Bethany Baptist Church under Bishop David G. Evans in Lindenwald. My son, Hassani, 
is 26 years old, a graduate of St. Joe's Prep and the Catholic University of America. He is a Jesuit, a Helen Hayes award-winning actor, and has performed on the main stage on many occasions in leading roles at the Walnut Street Theater, Ford's Theater, and recently the Kennedy Center with Mo Willems. The reason I begin my testimony with who we are is because I want you to know we are not troublemakers. We are not Antifa. We are not members of the Black Lives Matter movement. We are not looters. We are not rioters. We are the citizens and resident voices who decided to come out of our homes in the middle of a pandemic to speak out against and march against police brutality and all the other inequities which exist in our country, which were highlighted by the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd. I began this testimony with who we are because our degrees, awards, accolades, and accomplishments are as invisible to the Philadelphia Police Department as my parents' Ivy League degrees were back in the 70s when they marched for the very same issues. Yes, we are three generations marching against police brutality in the city of Philadelphia. 50 years is my entire lifetime. I just want to repeat that. An entire lifetime of no systematic change. My testimony is about the attack that occurred on June 1st against peaceful protesters. The day was very different from the other protest days in that organizers organized to meet at the police station away from City Hall and the municipal building. I could tell the march was different because there were speakers, there was an agenda and they for what they wanted to see happen in the city of Philadelphia and in our nation. It was not just about the police. They spoke about the pandemic, education, and all of the systems of inequity in our city and country. The crowd was celebratory, and I was very proud of the young people that were there. Um, they were taking care of one another. They were handing out masks, water, signs, and snacks. And I marched with them all day. I was there from the beginning to the end. At about 4.30 p.m., as we approached the parkway, my sister and I, we needed to sit down. Uh, and as we sat at the foot of a statue um, and we watched the crowd pass by, I became very emotional because I had no idea how large the crowd had grown. And seeing so many young, mostly white people standing with us made me become very emotional. As I sat there, I literally felt all of my anger dissipate. The kids and the young people in that group, and my son was somewhere in there with them also, but they came over to us and they offered us water, tissues, loving words. They said things to us like, don't cry, we love you guys. Oh my God, we're with you. 20 minutes later, we were still sitting there and the crowd was still passing us by and we began to hear cannon-like booms. So my sister, niece and I got up and we ran over to see what was going on. And the police had begun dropping tear gas at the entryway of I-76 ramp to prevent the remaining protesters from entering the highway, of which there was already a very large crowd down there. Initially, we were running over to join them on the expressway because from above, it looked really cool. So the thing that stopped us was the ramp was blocked. So we marched along the top with a large group of people cheering the protesters on. We were at the top of the ramp on 21st Street when we saw a police officer standing on the median, pepper spraying the front line of the protest under the cover of the underpass. And let me say that this was our testimony before it came out in the New York newspaper. That same front line that we had been walking behind all day. You immediately saw people trying to disperse because the ramp was being tear gassed. There was no retreat. And from above, we began seeing police in black advancing with more tear gas and shooting rubber, rubber bullets at the same young people who had just showed us so much love minutes before. 
We were at the gate at the top of the hill. We watched the panic and horrific assault on the protesters who tried to climb the steep hill. Many, once they got to the top, could not climb the fence. You saw people screaming and yelling for help. I distinctly remember seeing a young girl who was about 17 years old, no more than 100 pounds, pleading for someone to help her reach the top of the gate to get over. Two people literally hoisted her and threw her over the gate. She fell right to the ground, knocking everybody down. And she was screaming that her skin was on fire, that she could not breathe and that she could not see. Those of us on the parkway were trying to help the people literally falling over the gate, vomiting, screaming. It was horrible. They were laying all over the sidewalk. People were running over trying to help. And the helicopter just flies up over us and starts barraging all of us on the parkway with canister after canister of tear gas. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. I didn't know where to run. We ended up in front of the Barnes Museum, throwing up, crying. A young white girl came over, washed our faces, stayed with us until we could sit up. What really bothered me about the events from that day was that the attack was unprovoked, but the lies that ensued from the city of Philadelphia until video footage was provided was even more unsettling. And it's what black people have to deal with on the daily basis. I asked city council to act and reform the Philadelphia Police Department. I asked that you dismantle all systems of racism, including the school district of Philadelphia and the city of Philadelphia. And I ask you to act now before the fourth generation of Hankinsons do not have to raise their families to have to protest and overcome these same racist systems of oppression that myself, my children, and my parents had to. Thank you for your time and allowing me to give my testimony. Thank you so much, Ms. Hankinson, for your powerful words. Thank you. Next, we have Rachel Ludzinski. I'm here, thank you. Thank you, city council members, for being here and willing to hear me speak. My name is Rachel Lijinski. Um, I'm a children's librarian living and working in South Philadelphia. I care deeply for the community I live in, my neighbors, the families that I've come to know, the children that I see every week at story time, um, the families that I hear and see which is why on June 1st, I decided to march in protest of the police brutality and racism I've witnessed both in my community and in my library. On the morning of June 1st, I walked to Center City and joined a group of hundreds calling for justice for George Floyd's death, police accountability, and an end to police brutality. I was near the front of the crowd that marched from police headquarters towards the art museum, a crowd that included some of those same family, friends, and neighbors that I see in my home, in my community, and in my library. When we neared the art museum, groups of organizers with bicycles near the front with me turned left towards I-676 and began halting traffic so that protesters behind us could safely cross the highway and march onto it. I joined them and assisted in forming a protective barrier facing west to stop oncoming traffic. Traffic stopped and more protesters entered behind us onto the highway marching east back towards Center City. When I sat on the highway in front of traffic, a single state trooper drove his car through the traffic and parked directly in front of me and the others forming a barrier. We stood our ground and he exited the car and stood there for several minutes. The only thing he said to us was, we just want you to be safe. It was a statement that was offered with no clarification, no warning. It was a statement that said that he and others had already made up their minds about how the events of that day would play out. I stayed sitting with others at the barricade for another 10 to 15 minutes. Throughout this time, protesters continued to head east on the highway behind us and we saw the National Guard and police begin to arrive from the east, pinning us in. The only verbal communication we received from the police was the one line from the state trooper, no other warnings or announcements were giving over megaphone or otherwise. After about 10 minutes, we started hearing screams and we turned to see people running surrounded by giant clouds of smoke. 
by the time we had turned back around, the single state trooper had taken out two cans of mace and began pepper spraying all of us point blank in the face. I couldn't see or breathe. And when I turned to run, I was hit by a cloud of tear gas that was blowing straight into my face from the other direction. The state trooper followed me from behind and continued to spray my back and my upper neck with pepper spray. I was blinded, I couldn't see anything. I ran into a few other people who managed to help me over the median that was in the middle of the highway so that I could get off the highway. I managed to get to the grassy hill on the side of the highway and crawled up on all fours. At this point, I was still unable to open my eyes to see where I was going. They burned along with the exposed skin on my neck, my arms and my face. I was still breathing in tear gas, which made me panic. It's a feeling that feels like no matter how much air you are breathing in, you aren't breathing enough of it. It felt like I was being suffocated. For the next half hour, I tried using a towel and water to flush out my eyes. Strangers would come up to me and help when they could. When I began to see a bit better, I also helped several strangers, a teenage girl with asthma who was gasping for breath, and an older woman who was on the side of the highway suffering from tear gas that had blown over to her. Helicopters continued to fly very low over the highway and dumped tear gas every few minutes. I stood with others on a bridge looking over 676 while police cuffed and lined up protesters to be arrested, all of whom were actively struggling to breathe from the tear gas and the pepper spray. While we watched, police would randomly shoot onlookers on the bridge with rubber bullets unprovoked. Taking showers is one of the best ways to remove pepper spray from the skin, but it's also excruciating. Over the following month, I took countless showers trying to get rid of the pepper spray. Every time the water came in contact with my face, arms, or upper body, it felt like being sprayed all over again. My skin burned. I started uncontrollably coughing, and if it got into my eyes, I couldn't see for the next half hour. I had second degree burns along my upper back from the spray and my clothes held so much tear gas and pepper spray, I had to throw them all away, including my shoes. Anytime I would sweat on my face, it would reactivate the pepper spray. And if it tripped into my eyes, I wouldn't be able to see. I was unable to go to work for two weeks. The events of June 1st were horrifying and Mayor Kenny and Commissioner Outlaw's outright lies the following day were a slap in the face to me and the community they claim to represent and serve. It stands as a clear example of how removed the PPD are from accountability or any true understanding of how to best serve their communities. Apologies from the Commissioner and Mayor are also meaningless unless backed up with substantive action. Tear gas and chemical weapons have never been used in peaceful, pro peaceful protest and should never be used again. The PPD's budget is astronomical while libraries, schools and parks are given less and less and expected to make ends meet. Please help us prevent violence like this from happening again. Please help us pull money and resources from the police into places it belongs. Our community, our schools, our public health programs, our libraries and our parks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Holodinsky, um, for your testimony. We deeply appreciate it. Um, the will the clerk please call the next panel? Yes, for the next panel, we have Austin Gordon, Brandon Trush, Simone Brown, and Matthew Ober. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being so patient. Uh, we welcome you um, to this hearing today and please take your time um, and we really appreciate your your testimony. Mr. Gordon. Yeah, hey, uh, good evening. My name is Boston Gordon. Um, thanks for having me for my testimony. On the afternoon of June 1st, 2020, I joined the protests against police overuse of force and violence calling for justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and others. I joined a group of about a thousand at Independence Hall and we marched across the city until we reached the Ben Franklin Parkway. At that time, shortly before the start of the evening, some of the protesters started to make their way slowly onto the 676 highway via the ramp just west of 22nd Street. Just as we, as we had been taking control of smaller streets throughout the city in order to nonviolently disrupt the normal flow of life and bring attention to the injustice and violence perpetrated by our current policing system, the idea to take highways for short periods of time is the same, but with elevated impact. I crossed the westbound side of 676 and hopped over the medium to the eastbound side with some difficulty due to my bike being in tow. Protesters at this point were walking eastbound on both sides and holding signs and chanting. 
since the police had already closed a lot of exits on and off the highway to keep cars out of Center City in anticipation of protests, the traffic was very low on 676. The few dozen or so cars were all stopped and several honked their horns cheerfully in solidarity. As soon as I was underneath the overpass, the crowd began to panic a little and shift backwards. Later, I would see footage of officers in the front of the crowd pepper spraying kneeling protesters under their masks and shooting rubber bullets directly at people. At the time, I only heard pops like firecrackers or gunshots and the crowd making noise. As the crowd turned around, I turned with them. Since I had my bike in hand, I was slower and again had some difficulty getting over the median in order to make my way off the highway. Once I was at the bottom of the hill on the westbound side of 676, pops went off again and I saw smoke. I turned to my partner and said, is that tear gas? Having never in many years of protesting seen it used live before. The tear gas was shot onto the ramp we had used to get on the highway, so getting back up that way was no longer an option. As more pops went off on both sides of the overpass, the crowd began to panic more. I was still at the bottom of the hill, struggling to get up with my bike in tow. The ground was made of really loose dirt, and the hill was very steep, and the tear gas had already drifted into the crowd. I looked behind me and saw an armored vehicle on 676 with a state trooper on top, shooting tear gas canisters directly at me. These canisters landed directly into the crowd of us on the hill. I heard someone next to me yell that a fellow protester had been hit and needed a medic. My lungs filled with a burning sensation, and myself and everyone around me started to cough wildly. The mask I was wearing due to the COVID-19 pandemic seemed to have only trapped the tear gas powder close to my face. I could no longer see due to my eyes burning. At this point, I panicked, feeling like if I stayed on the hill one second longer, I might die from not being able to breathe or that I might be trampled by panicking protesters. I dropped my bike and crawled on my hands and knees as fast as I could up the hill. My hands, knees, shins, and elbows all sustained bleeding scrapes. I also injured my rotator cuff from trying to haul my bike up the hill. On top of the hill, a fellow protester doused my face with cool water, and I thanked them while my eyes teared over, trying to rid themselves of the tear gas powder. I ran back to the hill, screaming for my partner, looking for them now that I could see a little bit. They, along with our bicycles, were being held up, were being helped up the hill. Sorry, were being helped up the last few feet of the hill by fellow protesters. I helped them rinse out their eyes, and we retreated, looking for our friends who had stayed up on the parkway. Tear gas canisters landed up on top of the hill where retreating protesters were being treated for injuries and tear gas. It looked like they had been dropped from a police helicopter that flew very, very low over our heads, but I could not be sure about that. They may have been tossed up from police officers on the highway. The fact that I felt being, <clears throat> sorry, the fear that I felt being attacked by the armed wing of my local government for peacefully protesting is something that will never leave me. The days that followed, I struggled to reconcile the hatred and anger I felt with my values as a person with compassion, as someone who believes in loving people even when they make mistakes, as a Christian who believes in love thy neighbor above all things. What I felt is only a tiny slice of the terror consistently described by black Americans who fear interactions with the police and are forced to watch the recorded executions of their unarmed community members as part of the spectacle of death and suffering caused by the police in this country. To protest death, murder, torment, persecution, and racism, and have the response of the police be swiftly handed out violence speaks volumes. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you so much, Boston. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, testifying next, we have Brandon Trush. Um, thank you all council members um, uh, for this very necessary hearing. My name is Brandon Trush and I reside in South Philadelphia. On June 1st, 2020, I protested peacefully in Philadelphia as part of a national movement to end police brutality. After encountering an unannounced Philadelphia police SWAT team on Interstate 676, who were dispersing tear gas and less than lethal munitions at unarmed protesters, I attempted to flee the highway, but was barricaded by yet another SWAT team. I was verbally directed by officers to go on an embankment that had no other escape than a tall wall. Police continuously fired tear gas into the open crowd and I could not breathe nor see well. I realized that I was too far from the wall and I did not attempt to make it over. I turned around with my hands up to face the SWAT officers who were positioned on the highway. Moments later, I was struck on the chin by a less than lethal munition. 
I was immediately incapacitated and in a state of shock. I placed myself on the ground as blood poured from my chin, focusing solely, excuse me, on breathing. I was detained and restrained with plastic zip ties. I repeatedly asked for medical attention because the pain from the impact felt like my jaw was broken. I continued to bleed on my clothing while detained and eventually what felt like hours, I was taken off I-676 to wait for a paddy wagon to take me to the hospital. The vehicle never arrived. I was later released from police custody because as one officer stated to me, we cannot take you to jail in this condition. Officers drove me to Thomas Jefferson University Hospital for emergency treatment. I am reminded every day of the events that took place when I look in the mirror. I feel ashamed of the Philadelphia Police Department for acting so harmfully and cowardly towards its peaceful citizens. However, my emotion does not stem from my own injuries. Rather, it comes from the sheer hate that I felt and saw officers act within response to the message that Black lives matter. It is important to distinguish that in our society, Black men, women, and children are not confronted with less than lethal munitions. They're shot with real bullets, assaulted with knees to necks, chokeholds, and a bevy of other excessive force strategies by police officers with the intent to kill. And while you're not gonna find cops indiscriminately assaulting or murdering white folks left and right, you will see them act with excessive force towards the solidarity of the movement. Here in Philadelphia, we know that armed vigilante groups were allowed to roam freely while wielding weapons under the guise of the law and order rhetoric. Moving forward, I strongly suggest that the Philadelphia Police Department ban the use of tear gas, a chemical weapon banned from warfare, and cease the use of less than lethal munitions on unarmed civilians. Moreover, I ask that council acknowledge without provocation that black and brown communities are unquestionably the primary targets of police brutality in our city and in this nation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for your courageous testimony. And we're so sorry for what happened. Next, we have Simone Brown. Hello, first I wanted to thank you guys, council members for providing this platform. Um, to discuss these pertinent issues. Uh, my name is Simone Brown. I'm a senior studying psychology and neuro neuroscience at Tuffle University. And on June 1st of 2020, I became a victim of police brutality. What happened to me and my friends that day is something I will never be fortunate enough to forget. And due to this longstanding trauma, I felt a certain sense of obligation to my community in order to make sure situations like the one I encountered never happen again. Two of my friends and I were protesting with a large group on Broad Street when the crowd started to head towards the I-76. I was not one of the first on the highway. I only followed the massive crowd. Once we began marching down the freeway, I was overcome with a sense of unity and it was elated by the huge turnout for the protest. This joyous feeling soon faded when we all heard deafening flashbangs and the crowd ahead of me quickly began to retreat and run back towards the entrance of the freeway. At this point, there was complete chaos and I had lost both my friends that had accompanied me as I tried to look for them, I was met with police armed in heavy riot gear and sprayed with pepper spray without warning from behind. I stumbled, I scraped my knee on the pavement and quickly got up to head towards the panicked crowd by the highway fence in fear of getting sprayed again or struck by a heavy baton the officers were wielding. I was finally able to find my friend Summer once on the hill and quickly realized a safe escape was futile as the cops were purposely trapping us and throwing tear gas in the crowd. At this point, I was choking and my nose felt like it was on fire as I was gasping for air while clinging to my friend and a young, another young boy who cried for his mom. We all crouched by the wall, hoping for any type of relief until Summer was forcibly ripped off the wall by an officer without warning. Another officer then motioned for me to get up. I complied and as I attempted to exit again, I was brutally shoved from behind, jumped on and cuffed. The officer then dragged me down the dirt hill and ordered me to sit on the highway divider for 45 minutes to an hour before getting a transport bus to the precinct. During this time on the divider, I, was wit I witnessed a police officer tear off, a, tear off a protester's mask and throw it on the ground. I saw that another protester was denied medical attention after experiencing a panic attack. And I also witnessed an officer throw a detained young woman's phone in the bushes after pleading for it to be returned. 
When we finally arrived at the Montgomery precinct, I was then met with condescending police who then taunted that I would never be able to find a job due to my apparent hostile demeanor, um, which was completely unwarranted. I was then threatened to be thrown into a cell for the night and was forced to answer personal questions with officers that did not care to wear, wear protective masks during the COVID-19 pandemic. After answering all these questions, I was issued a citation for failure to disperse, even though I had no opportunity to do so while trapped on the expressway. I want to end by saying that the actions I witnessed performed by, performed by the Philadelphia police force were absolutely unacceptable and despicable. As a community, we can no longer stand by and continue to be martyrs while the people we naturally want to recognize as our protectors show such a blatant disregard for human life. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Matthew Ober. Hello. Um, I just want to thank the council um, for listening and uh, everyone who testified earlier for your stories and perspectives. Um, my name is Matthew Ober. Uh, I live in West Philadelphia. On June 1st, 2020, uh, along with my friend George, who testified earlier, I participated in the Black Lives Matter protest uh, against police brutality and anti-Black racism. Um, the march started at the police headquarters and went through Center City uh, all the way to uh, Benjamin and Franklin Parkway and 22nd Street. At about 5 p.m., uh, we followed the march on to Interstate 676 uh, heading east. Traffic on the highway was halted and cars around us were honking in support. Uh, at this point, our morale and energy was soaring. Um, uh, as the crowd approached an overpass, uh, the police pushed back, uh, blocking our way. We weren't at the front, but uh, we could tell that something was happening. Um, and this pushback enclosed us into a, a section of the highway. Um, George and I backed up onto an embankment on the side of 676. Uh, where we started filming um, and we saw a few officers at the front of uh, dividing the protest and the overpass, a few officers spraying pepper spray at uh, the peaceful protesters kneeling before them, um, seemingly trying to provoke them with some sort of sick like glee. Um, then suddenly without warning, I started to cough uh, and my eyes were burning. I didn't know what was happening, but could pretty immediately tell uh, it was tear gas um, and the, the, that the police had doused uh, the whole crowd with tear gas without uh, giving any warning. Uh, we immediately uh, scrambled up the embankment, which we had deemed uh, the most direct escape route because there was nothing else clear to us. Uh, at, we, and then we saw at the top a seven foot tall, seven or eight foot steel fence uh, trapping everybody in. And we were lucky to be at the already on the embankment and so close to the fence. And if not, things likely might have been a lot worse. Um, and this moment was, was chaotic and terrifying, as everyone has said already. Um, Everyone desperately trying to climb this fence while coughing, shielding their eyes, saying they couldn't breathe. Um, and running on adrenaline, I helped to lift a few people over. Um, and, and also, like, like people have said earlier, it, it really felt very surreal, like a dream or, or like a video game, like I've heard a couple people um, already say. Um, and George uh, trying to help people over, uh, as he said, someone fell on him, dislocating his shoulder. Um, and we, we made sure he was up and okay um, and got him over the fence. And then I got myself over the fence and we washed our eyes out, um, then uh, escaped the range of the tear gas cloud, which, which did blow for a number of blocks. We had to walk a few blocks away from uh, 22nd or 
wherever on 676 it was. We had to walk a few blocks away to get out of the range. Um, and then we were able to make it back um, to our home in West Philadelphia. Um, and uh, for George, uh, George's shoulder has been in pain since the incident. Um, it and it compounded an existing injury for him. And as he said, he'll he'll need to get surgery on it. Um, and for myself, um, for about two or three weeks following the incident, I experienced restlessness, um, difficulty focusing, um, and insomnia. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for testifying and again, we're very sorry um, for all that transpired um, and we will take your testimony to heart. Um, will the clerk, I think that concludes uh, the fifth panel. Um, we are now moving into the final panel and then there will be public comment. Um, so will the clerk please call the final panel? On the final panel are Sandy Katz, Justin Mayer and Matt Sullivan. Will Sandy Katz uh, state your yes. name? Yes. Yes. This is Sandy Katz. I'm a Center City resident and I'm 61 years old. It's taken me a while to be ready to share my experiences from June 1st. My daughter Molly and I joined the protest in Philadelphia. We marched peacefully with the crowd as they assembled for miles. There were thousands of us. The crowd grew bigger as we walked, although I was disappointed to note how few people over 35 there were. As the leaders of the march peacefully turned onto 22nd Street, they were stopped by armored vehicles and the police. Meanwhile, my daughter Molly and I in about the middle of the crowd marched with protesters who were unable to, to continue forward due to the police action ahead of us. Unaware of what was going on in front of us, we followed the marchers onto the 676 highway where we peacefully continued to march. Traffic was stopped, but there was no violent behavior by the protesters. At one point, we both felt an irritant and when Molly asked about it, I encouraged her to continue the protest believing that we would be safe since all was peaceful. I was wrong. Tear gas was shot at us, along with what I now know was pepper spray and rubber bullets. I think the police may have also thrown small ex explosives as more gas was released into the crowd. We were trapped. I was blinded and gasping for air. We dropped our signs and ran up an embankment, but I was not able to climb the fence. We, there we lost track of each other, and I didn't realize it at the time, but it was a stranger and not my daughter who lifted me over the fence. Then I came upon a second fence that I couldn't scale. I whipped off my masks and cried for the first time in my life for help. I couldn't breathe. Another stranger guided me, since I could no longer see anything, to a place where I could step past the fence. I stumbled through and was handed water to douse my face. Once I could see again and was no longer blinded, I looked for my daughter. In the meantime, she was desperately looking for me. She regained her faculties when someone handed her milk to wash off the gas. Once reunited, we headed back to my home in Center City so that we could shower off the noxious gases. We both returned to work the next day, but my experiences that day shaped the way I now see the Philadelphia Police Department the indiscriminate use of these chemicals against peaceful protesters shook my faith to the core. It was traumatic and disillusioning. I am a first generation American, the daughter of a school teacher and a father who was awarded bronze, a bronze star during World War II. I never believed that in this country, one of which I am so proud, I would be harmed for peacefully expressing my opinion. It's still hard for me to believe that the peaceful protest in which I participated brought on such a violent reaction. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. 
Next, we have Justin Mayer. Hello. Uh, my name is Justin Meyer. Uh, I'm a 34-year-old graphic designer living in Center City. I'd like to say it's both an honor and a privilege to speak before City Council today in regards to the events of June 1st, 2020. That day, I participated in a peaceful protest as a part of a uh, international civil rights response to the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd at the hands of American police. At uh, 5 p.m., I met up with two friends, Nita Froggett and Michelle Uche at 8th and Cherry. Uh, there was a crowd of thousands gathered on Ray Street, calm and responsibly socially distancing. Uh, despite fears of COVID, the mood that day was actually light and jovial. Uh, groups were talking amongst themselves while volunteers handed out supplies like trail mix bars, bananas, peanut butter jelly sandwiches, and bottles of water. Uh, around 30 to 45 minutes later, the crowd began marching. Uh, we marched over to Broad Street and then onto the parkway. Um, part of the demonstration turned on 22nd Street, and our group settled against the westbound exit off of 676. Uh, vehicle traffic on 676 was slow, either bumper to bumper or stopped entirely. For several minutes, we assessed whether or not to enter the roadway uh, before seeing thousands of demonstrators suddenly marching on the eastbound lane. So we joined en masse. Uh, the demonstration on 686 was joyous and absolutely peaceful with cars often honking in support of our movement. We collectively marched eastbound uh, against the stop traffic on and into the 20th Street Tunnel. But within five to 10 minutes, I heard a crashing noise and dozens of people running back west in a panic uh, away from clouds of smoke. Um, after an instinctive bout of confusion, I sort of gathered my wits and tried to find my friends, uh, finding my friend Michelle, but not Nina. Um, crowds were immediately exiting the roadway up a hill that was directly eastbound of 21st Street. So we followed suit. Um, at that point, police appeared from both inside the tunnel and from the eastbound lane, firing round after round of tear gas canisters into crowds of peaceful protesters without warning to disperse. Round after round of tear gas canisters into crowds of peaceful protesters trying to escape. So we all inhaled tear gas and were completely incapacitated, unable to escape. I assisted my friend Michelle and myself up the hill uh, and after several minutes, we found ourselves on the grass, uh, up on the parkway, uh, getting assistance from uh, street medics. Um, within 20 minutes, we were able to breathe again. We uh, reconnected with our friend Nina and we all walked home. Um, I'd like to reiterate that we heard no warning or announcements to disperse from the police, verbal or otherwise. We didn't hear a siren. Um, their response was completely unprovoked. None of us were armed or violent towards either individuals or property. Uh, every one of us suffered residual effects, psychological and physical, uh, from that gas attack for weeks to come. So criminalizing the use of chemical weapons against the civilian population, defunding and dismantling this militarized police department, and distributing those taxpayer dollars to much-needed community services, which would directly combat the causes of crime, are, in my view, the best way to resolve these long-standing social problems. Um, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you for listening. And I'd like to thank everyone else for their testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Matt Sullivan and Gwen Snyder. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Sullivan. I want to thank everybody who took the time to be here today. I want to thank everyone who's testified. And I do want to thank Council Member again for hosting this listening session. It is important that everybody knows what the police did on May 31st and on June 1st. And this has to be the start, but not the end of efforts to make real change in policing in our city. Uh, I live in Westfield with my wife. While we were on 676, we were also present on 52nd Street. I want to speak to that briefly uh, before I move on. On Sunday the 31st, we heard from a friend that the police were brutalizing members of the community up on 52nd Street. And we decided to go out to support those protesters. The police had formed a line near the L and they were staring protesters down from some distance away. Uh, they had an armored vehicle behind them that looked like a tank. The group of protesters did have some young teenagers in it and that made it even more shocking when, not long after we arrived, the police fired tear gas at us. We ran back down 52nd Street and around a corner. Tear gas is painful, but it is also deeply disorienting. And my wife and I were lucky that a neighborhood family let us collapse on their stoop. They brought us water and they let us wash out our eyes. 
We returned to the police line, which had moved further south on 52nd Street. We talked to another protester who had not planned to come out, but had been driven out of his house by the gas. The police had fired so much that it had seeped into his house and made it unlivable. While the police took the chance to try to appeal to their decency. Protesters spoke about the horror of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and their fear for their own lives and the lives of their families. One young man walked down the line of police asking them one by one, officer, do you believe that Black Lives Matter? Do you believe that Black Lives Matter? People were crying. Councilmember Gossier arrived after dark and spoke with some of the other protesters for a long time. She asked for everyone to go home for our own safety in exchange for an agreement that she would meet with protesters in a week and advocate for change in council. The protest out in West Philly felt pretty desperate and by contrast, the march in Center City on June 1st felt joyful. Protesters seemed shocked at how many people were there and it was like they were feeling their own power. When my wife and I began marching on 676, I was happy to see people were getting out of their cars and waving and cheering in support of us. We weren't close enough to the front to even see a line of police when the entire march turned as one and began fleeing back to where we had come from but the smell of tear gas is unmistakable. I had goggles, but they don't fit over my glasses and I'm nearsighted. I was scared of losing track of my wife in the chaos, so I took the goggles off to put my glasses back on and the gas hit us immediately. We got up the hill leading off of 676. It's steep and my wife nearly fell. At the top, we tried to help people who had caught more of the gas than us by pouring water in their eyes. Just a mass of crying, blinded, terrified people. My wife and I returned to the top of the hill to see if we could help. There were arrestees and cuffs on 676 and some people were still clawing their way up to us. I went a little bit of a way down the hill to see if I could help. There was one woman who was trying to get to safety whose eyes were closing on her. The police were yelling at her to get off of 676 and she was yelling back to them, where am I supposed to go? She sounded terrified. We called out to her to come toward our voices. As we were trying to help people up, the police shot me in the leg with a rubber bullet. I looked down on 676 and I saw the policeman with a gun and I saw him giving me the kind of look that guys give you when they're trying to be intimidating. Now I was scared, but I was scared of the gun, not, not of his mean mug. And something about the ridiculousness of the situation meant that anger beat out fear and pain for a moment. And I gave the cop the finger before turning to run. For that, he shot me in the lower back. I still have a small bru bruise there, although since it's been three months now, maybe it's more of a scar than a bruise. I didn't find out until much later that my wife had also been shot at. We were arrested later on that night for a curfew violation. We were loaded on Sheriff's Department buses for a few hours before being driven to a police station near Temple, cited, and then released. It's my understanding that those citations are not gonna be enforced, but the effects of the arrest go deeper than just a citation. My wife has had pain in her wrist from being left in too tight zip cuffs for too long. We're afraid that it could be nerve damage. My leg and back and her wrist are not the only physical reminders that we have from those two days. A couple weeks after the arrest, my wife went to the Will's Eye emergency room after temporarily losing some of her vision in one eye. The doctor said it was, could have been from stress. She has also seen some scary changes in her monthly cycle. And after reading up on tear gas, we've discovered that it can act as an abortive fashion. This has been very hard for us because we're trying to start a family. The systemic racism that we were out there protesting against on those two days has not been solved. Our police departments have not stopped killing people of color. Our city will be out marching for justice again and again. We will be in the streets no matter how hard the police try to silence us. But we have enough martyrs. City Council must use its power to save lives by holding the police accountable and by taking away the tools that the police use to silence protest. Ban tear gas, ban baton rounds. Let's put an end to police brutality. Defund the police. Black Lives Matter. Thank you for your time. My name is Gwendolyn Snyder. Uh, I'm a community, a community organizer and a community person in the 27th Ward. Uh, and I'm here to give testimony this day, October 7th, 2020, on resolution number 200397. Uh, my husband and I came to 52nd Street because we heard they were shooting and gassing black people there and that white bodies were needed. When we got there, it was like a war zone, uh, not because of riots. There was no rioting. Uh, there were people who had been gassed out of their homes. There were people coming home from or going to work. There were people taking their children to the supermarket, but there was no rioting. There was no rioting, but there was an armored occupying force and a pervading sense of terror. People were standing there in the street 
hang on, hanging on to the sense that they needed to be there, that it was necessary. But as much as anything else, people were just wandering days, just periodically running in fear when the police approached. When they moved in on us, it was quiet, no warning, just stormtroopers grimly marching on us with a tank behind them. And then shots fired and screams and mostly darkness because it was painful to open our eyes. We'd been gassed. We were running, we turned a corner. We questioned ourselves even as we stopped to get water and rinse our eyes. We thought they were coming for us. We thought they would try and see how else they could hurt us, maybe try to finish us off. Uh, I've never been to war, but I imagine it feels something like that. Like the bottom fell out. These were Philadelphia police, police supposedly here to serve us. They did that to us. And the next day they gassed us again. We had goggles that time at least. We struggled up the hill through the clouds of tear gas, began trying to help other victims rinse their eyes. People were still trapped on the parkway. The police were hunting them like animals. My husband went to help a straggler up the hill. I stood waiting at the edge, tearing up despite the goggles, figuring they need their eyes rinsed once they got up. Uh, I was far away from the parkway up on the hillside and a stormtrooper spotted me, aimed a rifle at me. He fired and I ran again. My husband staggered over to me a moment later. They'd shot him twice with baton rounds, once in the back, once in the thigh. By the evening, his wounds would be the size of dinner plates. The protest then, we joined a crowd kneeling outside the roundhouse. Police joined us. Later that day, they arrested us. My husband and I were walking on the sidewalk peacefully. They ran up behind us yelling, told us to get on our knees, put to on tight cuffs and interrogated us. They threw me in a bus with other women. The zip cuffs aren't supposed to stay on longer than half an hour, but we'd been in them for 45 minutes at least. We were in agony. Uh, women were screaming, crying, throwing their bodies against the sides and the door of the bus, begging for mercy and uh, wailing in agony. It was the most horrifying and inhuman thing I have ever witnessed. Uh, the cop guarding us looked like he was about to cry. He kept begging for our forgiveness for doing nothing. He said they would fire us if he tried to help us. It was so painful. For a week, I would scream in pain whenever my husband reached to touch my hand. It's been months. My arm and my wrist still hurt from it sometimes. It might be permanent nerve damage. I had to go to Will's Eyes Hospital after it happened. I'd suddenly begun losing vision in my left eye. It cost us the better part of $1,000 to find out that I had an ocular migraine for the first time in my life. Stress induces them, the doctor said. A little while after it happened, we found out that the gas is mortifacent. We've been trying to start a family. I'd started bleeding profusely right when the gassing first happened. We're still not sure whether it was a period or a miscarriage. Uh, my periods since then have been torturous. The last one was so painful it sent me to bed for nearly three days, something that hasn't happened to me since high school. Uh, this past month, I had two periods in the course of less than two weeks. The gas is also a long-term hormone disruptor, we found out. So we don't know when we'll be able to have a family after what's happened to my system. I spent the summer jumping out of my skin every time a firecracker went off. I imagined how much worse this must be for the people who live along 52nd Street, who never had any say in whether they'd be a part of this, who had nowhere to go and police gassed them with a chemical weapon for a in the middle of pandemic quarantine. I will never forgive Mayor Kennedy and Commissioner Outlaw for what they did to us and for what they did to West Philly. They let their police do this. They gave permission. Shame on them. Shame. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we have public comment. Um, for individuals who registered for public comment, we have Yesenia Rodriguez, Chris Canito, Michelle Rifkin. Hello. Ernst. Yes. Yes. Hello? Uh, yes, uh, may I ask who's speaking? This is Michelle. Michelle? Okay. Yes. Are you, mm -hmm. um, and we'll start with you if you're on the phone. We'll start with you if you're on the phone. Hello? I apologize. Hello? Michelle, we have you testifying in just a minute. 
Yesenia is, is scheduled to begin her testimony first in this uh, order. If you would just okay. stay on the line, uh, I'll signal to you when it's uh, um, your turn to testify. Okay, thank you. Um, real quick, can I just ask you, um, I cut my testimony as close to two minutes as I could get it. It's a, like a few seconds over. Is that okay? Yes, that should be fine. Um, thank okay, you. Um, thank you. Yeah. And you'll let me know? Yes, your name yes, will I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Um, my name is Yesenia uh, Gutierrez, not Rodriguez. I'm a resident of Cops Creek in West Philly and an organizer with Penn Community for Justice, as well as Socialist Alternative. On June 1st, I joined thousands of Philadelphians protesting against the brutal murder of George Floyd by police, the most recent flashpoint in a long history of white supremacist police brutality, which includes their origins as slave catchers, the 1985 MOVE bombing, and Rizzo's administration. As we marched, suddenly and without warning, we were tear gassed by police. I avoided the worst of this initial attack, but as I helped other protesters trying to escape this chemical weapon, I was gassed again. Kind strangers gave me water and flushed my eyes as I struggled to breathe. When I asked a group of very young protesters trapped by tear gas and police in riot gear if they needed anything, an officer not 10 feet away pointed his gun at me across the gate along 676. Thankfully, unlike my friends, I was not hit with rubber bullets in the head and legs. The previous night, the PPD, with the help of private police forces like Penn and Drexel Police, terrorized residential communities along 52nd Street. For days, I heard constant sirens and flashbangs from my Cobbs Creek home. These did not make me feel safe. They were not meant to. They reminded me that the police were everywhere, they were riled up, and they had the budget and militarized equipment to continue their assault until they felt we were back in our place. These experiences are a drop in the ocean compared to the terror that police and other forces like ICE instill on working class people, people of color, indigenous people, and particularly black people across this country. Country. To be crystal clear, in the midst of worldwide historic protests against police, police brutality, police assaults on 676 and on 52nd Street, and a New York Times article forcing Mayor Kenny and Police Commissioner Outlaw to admit their sanctioning of police violence against residents, Mayor Kenny proposed a budget laying off hundreds of city workers and cutting vital city services. Every Democratic member of city council voted to approve Mayor Kenny's over $700 million police budget, making it by far the largest city department. Since he took office, Mayor Kenny and city council have increased the police budget by $120 million. If we weren't vigilant and organized and relentlessly protesting this year, they would have increased it again. And if we do not stay organized, they will increase it again next year. I am not asking city council for band-aid legislation. I am not asking city council to move crossing guards from the police budget to another department and call this a decrease in the budget as they did this year, or to use the language of quote reforms, unquote, like proposed body cams, equity manager, and implicit bias training, reforms that have been tried nationwide for decades and have been shown to be futile at eliminating police brutality. In instead serving to increase police budgets, or for City Council Mayor Kenny and Police Commissioner Outlaw to use crime as an excuse to increase technological police surveillance of working class black communities. The police exist to protect the private property of the rich and powerful capitalists, not us, from their rotten roots as slave catchers to their history of crushing black liberation and worker movements until their present day racist, classes and sexist violence, they cannot be reformed. Instead, what I'm asking for is the systematic defunding of the Philadelphia Police Department, reinvesting that money into city services like housing and education that are currently under attack by Mayor Kenny and City Council's austerity budget, even though they are proven to reduce crime, including violent crime, and improve quality of life for working class people, as well as a democratically elected community control board for, for the police with the ability to hire, fire, and investigate police and control the police budget. City Council should also support organizers demanding multi-billion dollar nonprofits like Penn contribute to pilots and tax wealthy corporations like Comcast to fund city services. These should be no-brainers if City Council is truly dedicated to reducing the violence in this city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and apologies for misstating your name, Ms. Gutierrez. Um, next, we have Chris Canito. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Canito. I'm a social worker, graduate student, and West Philadelphia resident and organizer with Penn Community Justice, who was attacked on I-676 by PPD on June 1st. I want to say thank you to everyone who shared their stories today and opening up a piece of themselves. I honestly hope you can find some peace and respite ahead. I want to thank the council members for creating the space, but this hearing represents a repetitive cycle our city and nation will continue to face because we have never properly unpacked, acknowledge, acknowledged, or reconciled how our nation's original racism is weaved into our public institutions, particularly public safety through policing. 
Council members, you are already part of the current cycle of trauma. You now have the opportunity to be part of transformative healing. As a social worker, I am well aware of the effects trauma has on our bodies, our minds, and how it ripples across generations and communities. I focus on global human rights and public health. I'm at a loss of words of how these concepts were ignored through tax paid violence by PPD amidst the pandemic. As traumatic as my experience on I-676 was, it is nothing compared to what consistently happens to black, indigenous, and people of color's bodies and minds across generations from arms of the state, such as police and ICE. On June 1st, I honestly did not think I had enough air in my lungs to make it over the fence on the embankment. I truthfully thought I was going to die. I'm saying that as someone who has been exposed to violence, to vicarious trauma and loss of life while serving in the field. I felt like I was about to choke or be trampled to death painfully. What hurt more was imagining how my loved ones would feel if I were to die on that hill. I do not wish that experience onto anyone. Seeing the police in their riot gear come up the hill through the smoke looked like something out of a dystopian nightmare. I was surrounded by screaming and the sounds of people retching in panic as we were blinded by gas. I was surrounded by people screaming, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, by blood, by vomit and dirt, as smoke and gas engulfed us, burning our eyes and our throats. I also saw beauty from the very protesters who were attacked, helping each other climb, calm themselves and find safety. What would this hearing look like if someone died on that embankment or on 52nd Street? After balancing on a bike to get over the fence, I was still met with tear gas and many of us walked to City Hall in a daze, only to be met by the National Guard. We did not try and burn the city down after being attacked. We were not demanding a pound of flesh. We were demanding peace, justice, and change as we are today. It infuriates me to my core that Mayor Kenny and Commissioner Outlaw only changed their tone after the New York Times investigation. This city's leadership has not condemned the attacks on 52nd Street, a predominantly black neighborhood minutes away from the site of the move bombing. I hope Mayor Kenny feels ashamed for his role in this. I hope you act boldly and with humanity going forward. I'm disappointed by your lack of acknowledgement and action by continuing to fund the PPD, the same force who the Plainview Project found in 2019 to have over 300 officers posting racist, bigoted, and violent content on social media many who were in leadership positions. Acknowledgement, naming, and ownership paved the way for healing and restoration of oneself. The same is true on a societal level. Our institutions, policies, and laws are primed to foster social inequity and ignore long-standing racial traumas. We need to acknowledge these hard truths because when they are ignored, cycles of harm continue. Words like abolition should not lead to vitriolic debate. We should all carry abolitionist energy because it means envisioning a more humane and peaceful society. There are steps we can take into, in the present to point us in that direction. I could see the humanity in many officers' eyes when I'm out there, and I could see the humanity in yours. I challenge you to acknowledge the inhumane practices within our institutions and act. To call out the flaws of our public safety systems, like within the PPD, which is skilled at protecting officers when they commit violence, yet denies the very justice for members of the public that when violence is directed at them. Our city might have more financial flexibility to support the community if you have billion dollar entities like the University of Pennsylvania and Comcast paying taxes. Our city may have less men in Fishtown and South Philadelphia with bats and guns around a colonizer statue if we didn't historically gentrify and separate our neighborhoods along racial and class lines. We may experience more hearings like today if you act boldly and commit to transformative, transformative change by defunding and demilitarizing the PPD over the next five years and investing in our communities, investing in housing in healthcare, and substance treatment and quality education, which are key determinants for many of the crimes our city experiences. Commit to a plan, challenge your roles, and bring us all to the table so we can pave a way forward. During these moments in history, leaders have a tendency for half measures. I'm asking you to break that cycle. 
their communities or organizations who have done this work long without the power of a podium pen or pocketbook that you have. Angela Davis said the issues we ignored in the 1860s were being fought for again in the 1960s. What will 2060 look like? What is going to happen when the next George Floyd is caught on camera? What if that happens in Philadelphia? Given to what you've been exposed to today, will you commit to break these cycles of trauma within our city and our nation? Or will you repeat history through inaction, denial, and ignoring the very trauma of the people you serve? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have our penultimate speaker, Michelle Rifkin. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Michelle Rifkin. I'm a proud West Philadelphian for 24 years now on my block for 15. I'm testifying today about what happened on and around 52nd Street on May 31st and also submitted a much more detailed written testimony about what I witnessed. We've been told the situation in West was so dire, so violent, the police had no choice but to gas our community for hours. They were responding to looting, surrounded, outnumbered. Reinforcements took hours to arrive. UPenn PD wasn't even there. All lies. I was at 52nd and Market just before 2, and it was quiet. Yet right after 2, PPD sends 11 cars to shut down the intersection and establish a field command. I returned at 3.30. There was already tear gas in the air, dozens of police vehicles, two tanks and countless cops, many in riot gear, multiple SWAT teams, one from UPenn. Cops later said they thought they'd have to shoot their way out of this intersection. I was at that intersection, one of maybe four adults there before 4 p.m., and the rest of this alleged mob was a group of maybe 30 angry children. None looked older than 16, and one was a nine-year-old girl. There was no press. Because cops staged under the train tracks, none of this is on the chopper cam tapes. I watched adult police in armor whip projectiles at children. They fired flashbangs at children. I asked cops why had they come, why throw things at children. I begged them to move away from the intersection, de-escalate. I was backed against a wall and saturated in pepper spray. I again asked for help, explanation, badge numbers, supervisor, and was ignored, mocked, and told to, quote, call the fucking mayor by a cop in riot gear pointing a weapon at me. Fearing they'd be killed, I told the children they needed to get out from under the tracks. With so few adults, no press, hidden from view, there was no protection from this army of maniacs. Meanwhile, looting had started at Parkside. People began vandalizing cop cars at Arch Street. They ignored all that and attacked me and a group of children. In my 41 years, I have never seen anything so disgusting. Police marched on a peaceful community, hid themselves under train tracks, assaulted children, lied about the timeline, then used this as justification to terrorize us. We... West Philly did not start this, and our children certainly are not to blame. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Michelle. Our final speaker is Ashlyn Ernst. Hi, um, my name is Ashlyn, and I represent. Come join the protests calling for justice and an overhaul of the broken racist police system. On June 1st, I was one of the folks arrested for failure to disperse. What I I was surrounded by fellow protesters desperately trying to disperse. Ashley, yes. Ashley, um, sorry, um, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you in between. Um, so you're coming in and out. So if there's a way for you to, um, uh, you know, I don't know if the connection is off, but um, you're, you're coming in and out. So sometimes we can hear you perfectly, but 
there are other points where we can't hear you at all. Okay, all right. You'll need this is better. Me. Yeah. So if it you is. just stay where you are right now, it's better. Okay. Thank you. Great. Yes. My apologies. Uh, okay. So uh, what I experienced, um, I was surrounded by fellow protesters. <laughs> Crying in pain as the gas to breathe and see through the thick, noxious gas. Excuse me, Ashlyn, we're still having trouble hearing you. Can I call you? Sure thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, here it goes. Yep. Hi. Hi. Does this work? Much better. Much better. Great. Okay. Um, I will go on then. Um, I have to kind of mute myself so I don't get the feedback, but um so I, you know, I felt like I was in a war movie. Um there were people scrambling to escape with police attacking from all sides, and I honestly didn't know if I was going to make it out alive. Uh, I peacefully surrendered to the officers on the scene as I was not able-bodied enough to escape over the 10-foot fence. I then had my belongings unnecessarily stripped from me by an officer. I was manhandled and bruised, and I got stuck on a crowded bus and sent to jail. In the following days, I heard Commissioner Outlaw and Mayor Kenny lie about the nature of the protest and what caused such a response from PPD. It was wildly painful watching this city turn its back on all of us who wanted to peacefully exercise our constitutional rights to call for justice in a clearly broken system. The trauma of this event continues to haunt me every single day. It took me weeks to be able to drive down 676 without having a panic attack. Despite the fact that my grandfather was a cop for 30 years, every time I see a police officer now, I truly and rightfully fear for my life. That day strongly reinforced the notion that the police force, as it is now, is not here to protect and serve the people. I expected so much more from this city that I've grown to love deeply over the past five years as a resident. Is this what Philadelphia stands for? Do we handle unrest by brutally assaulting and repressing dissenting voices? Or will we learn that this is only creates more tension and division? Will Philadelphia respond swiftly to calls for justice and systematically defunding the police or will we continue supporting a broken policing system that used taxpayer dollars to launch a militarized attack on unarmed civilians who were calling for justice for black lives? I strongly urge the council to comprehensively review the city's response to the unrest during this time. How dare we call ourselves the city of brotherly love when we reach for banned weapons of war to suppress peaceful protests? I also urge the council to listen to the calls for justice that were made during the peaceful protests that day to continue to support a grossly inflated police budget after the demands of the people were made clear is a continuation of tragic responses to the unrest by the city of Philadelphia. When we look back and review the events from that day, we might also create substantive changes or else history is doomed to repeat itself. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. That concludes the registered uh, public comment. Thank you very much. Are there any additional individuals who would like to testify on this resolution? In that case, um, I wanted to take a moment to recognize Council Member Brooks, who would like to make some concluding remarks uh, to this uh, evening. Thank you so much, um, Councilmember Gannon, um, and thank you, uh, Chair Jones, for this hearing. It was very informative, um, but I want to just thank all of the testimonies. I want to thank you for your bravery um, and let you know that um, you were heard um, loud and clear. Um, yeah, I, I just had to just recognize the sacrifice and the difficulty in 
telling your story um, and the amount of trauma that was experienced on both nights. Um, and I just wanted to let you guys know that I hear you um, and it's our job to continue to work through this so this does not happen again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Brooks. Are there any other council members who would like to speak? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Member Gim, for bringing this resolution uh, to us. And it was an important hearing um, that um, shed a lot of light on what happened both at 52nd Street and on um, I-76. I want to thank the people that testified um, today in both instances, and particularly the, the folk that said that they felt inner city African Americans pain, that they acknowledged that they could have rested in, in their privilege, but chose to come out of their comfort zone and join um, people on 52nd Street to bear witness and to be supportive of Black Lives Matter. Um, that's as, that is as important as some of the abolitionists, ab abolitionists were during the uh, fight for freedom in this country. We can't do this alone. We are in this together. Uh, and I, I was impressed by what you faced, your courage. I, I was impressed by the fact that you did not have to do it. Um, many of you acknowledged that, you know, that was one day or two days in your life and acknowledged that a lot of those kids that you were out there to protect live it every single day. That was powerful. And, and again, um, thank you all who uh, stayed throughout this hearing to listen to that testimony. Um, and the greatest honor we could have given you was to sit and not say anything. We have a, we have a propensity to want to talk, but today we, show, we showed our discipline to listen. And I was impressed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we recognize Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Councilman and Jim. I just want to thank you for I'm hosting this hearing and most importantly, I want to thank all of the individuals who gave their testimony. Their te testimony was inspiring. Their testimony was encouraging and most importantly, it was empowering mm -hmm. as it relates to the issue of justice and equality, not only for just African Americans, but for people as a whole and our, and our whole humanity. And so, uh, I thank you um, again, Councilman Gim. I thank Councilman Curtis Jones um, for spearheading this effort and, and, and hosting the hearing and look forward to the much needed work as it relates to the issue of police reform. And you know, one of my constituents who, who gave a very passionate testimony talked about uh, it would be great if um, and hopefully um, our commissioner, her team, our mayor um, are taking note of this particular hearing because they need to hear this. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, they're supposed to be professionals. Um, they're the individuals who are out and about on the street doing this work from a law enforcement standpoint. Um, the mayor, main individual who's leading the city, should really need to, really need to hear from the individuals who were severely impacted by that day. And I also heard a lot around around the issue of trauma um, through this hearing today. A lot of individuals are still severely impacted. And hopefully we'll figure out a way separate from the reform aspect, but how do we address this from a level of healing and addressing the trauma as a result of this particular issue as we move forward? And so, um, again, I thank you. And anyway, I can continuously be supportive of these efforts. And I also want to just salute um, our colleague, Councilman Jamie, Jamie Gardier, because um, Councilman Jones mentioned this during the, the initial hearings. She was out on 52nd Street. She was like, she was out there. And I, and I consider myself, you know, Kurt, uh, I grew up born and raised in South Philly. And so I kind of seen a whole lot, right? But I wasn't out there. 
the rubber bullets being shot at me with with tear gas being shot at me. And so uh, it, this is a very, very, very serious issue. And, um, you know, with all due respect, the same way um, that there was an apology given to the folks downtown, there should be an apology given to the people who live at on 52nd Street, just out of respect. And so I stand by that statement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Johnson. And we did want to acknowledge that uh, we were joined tonight by uh, Commissioner Outlaw and members of her team, as well as um, by a number of other uh, organizations, groups, representatives of the city. Um, you know, the, uh, the Police Advisory Commission, uh, and everybody in your, you know, in your, your space. Thank you. Um, Rue Landau at the uh, Commission on uh, Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations and a number of other uh, individuals who were invited and to, to witness and watch. And so we thank them for being here. Councilwoman, I, I yes. do see our commissioner who's here and, and thank you for acknowledging that because if you had not acknowledged that, then the wider public who, 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 who trained them wouldn't have had an opportunity to know that she is here, at least listening to the individuals who were impacted by that day. So thank you very much, Commissioner, for being on this call. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, you so much. Us. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we recognize uh, Council Member Green. Uh, brief. I just want to commend all the people that had the uh, bravery and the urgency to lift up their voice um, for tonight's listening session. Uh, Council Member Jones made a statement about listening and it was very important for us to listen to the various experiences uh, from a firsthand account that people um, lived both on 57th Street and 6th um, and provided more context to exactly what happened from their own perspectives and how it impacted them, not in the, only in the physical space, but also an emotional space, uh, not only themselves, but also their families and their friends. So I just want to thank all of the people that came to testify, those who want to testify just by voice and those who testified um, by video. It was very important for this conversation um, for the entire city of Philadelphia to listen to what happened and so we can take steps so this type of situation will not happen again. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge that uh, Council. we are also joined tonight by a number of other Council Members, uh, Catherine Gilmore Richardson, um, who was also out on 52nd Street uh, the night of May 31st as well, um, along with many others. I know you were also Council Member Jones um, and so, uh, you know, we want to thank all of our council body for taking this with the kind of weight uh, that we initially wanted to bring to it. Um, I want to also join my council colleagues in thanking all the testifiers, as well as everybody who tuned in from different parts of the city and city agencies. These testimonies weighed heavily on me like they did on many of you. I take them to heart. The words hold us accountable and I can't escape, you know, the words of Mr. Jaunty who spoke early on that I am black in America and I still fear for my children. They're the courageous words of ordinary Philadelphians who demanded more of us. I want to acknowledge that retelling and living these stories is extremely hard. I think you heard it in the pain and anger that many of our residents spoke. Every single person who stepped forward today who submitted and took the time to write out their testimonies, who engaged with our council body over the last few months, has done the city and their communities a profound public service. I apologize that you had to do this in the first place. As many of you emphasized, I want to make a commitment that this is a start. It is not the end. It is the start of a process of how we repair trust, of how we are reimagine policing and public safety. It's a process of healing and accountability and that your words, we always believed would be the foundation of that process. Your pain is unacceptable and your courage calls us to the task of building a more just Philadelphia. As you know, um, Mr. Chairman, the 
entire uh, public safety committee, along with council member Gilmore Richardson, will be introducing a bill in council tomorrow to formally uh, require the police department to enact a policy that bans the use of tear gas, rubber bullets, and other munitions um, in First Amendment situations. We will be continuing this hearing as well in a few weeks time to hear from some of the entities that are doing the investigations to invite them to give us an update. We will be hearing from national leaders in the policing reform work, and we will also hear from members of the administration. Um, I hope that uh, tonight and the last several hours was a reminder of why this work is so important, why we listen, why we believe that words matter, um, why we believe that it starts with our stories if we're going to see change and accountability. And to close, I will sit here and affirm that Black Lives Matter. Um, if there are no other uh, testimony, I want to say, I want to thank uh, Chairman Jones also for your leadership and partnership uh, for the work um, and the collegiality that our Public Safety Committee has taken on in, in undergoing this work. Um, and we will continue to hear from more members of the public. Um, and I just wanna, as formally as we can, um, ensure and ask, are there any other members of the public who would wish to testify on this resolution? Seeing none, the public hearing on resolution number 200397 is recessed to the call of the chair. Thank you and good night.